Hey, hey, Dave here, and before we get started with this episode about Sea of Stars, I want to uh, give a little update about some stuff going on on and around the show. First things first, uh, if you're looking to hear me on another podcast, I did a couple of guest appearances on the Left Behind Game Club podcast about Final Fantasy 16. Part one was released like last week, and part two will be released next week. So if you're looking forward to checking out uh, me talking about Final Fantasy 16 with a good group of people, Left Behind Game Club is the place to do it. Also want to shout out some stuff going on on the Patreon since this is the first episode in December. We'll have the Tales from the Way backlog episode for the Home Alone game for the Genesis. And at the end of December, patrons will get my top 10 games that were not released in 2023 that I played for the first time episode. Everybody will get the top games from 2023 episode. And as always, we want to say thank you to the patrons of the podcast, specifically Chris Nelson, the top three podcast crew, Zolgeek, Chris Copleen, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, Nick Vacori, Jill, Soccer, ZNA, Cupcake, Kyle, Christian S., Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, JD, Doug Leaf, Jason Emery, Rob Shack, Brian Skersha, Randall, Jake Martin, Jenny E., and many more. Your support is always appreciated, and with all that being said, let's get on to Sea of Stars. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Jackson, and you're listening to Tales from the Backlog. This is a video games review podcast where each week I'm joined by a guest to bring a game out of the backlog, play it, and discuss. I have two wonderful guests with me today. Both are friends of the show, uh, longtime recurring guests on the show. First up, one of my co hosts on a top three podcast, the warrior cook, Aaron Angle. Sup, boy? And we're also joined today by RPG Sicko and Wheels Hustler Ryan Arrington. Welcome back. Niggas. <laughs> Knew it was coming. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to be scared of him if you know it's coming. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> um, longtime listeners of the show will recognize Ryan and Aaron from many episodes in the past. Uh, last time the three of us did an episode together, I believe it was for the Elden Ring Newbies episode uh, back summer of 2022 or something like that we also did persona 5 together we also did the very first episode of the show about rocket league together and uh, aaron's been on a couple other episodes including another game that might come up in conversation the last episode we did together was about chained echoes and uh, final fantasy 6 so uh, many times these guys have been on the show and we're here with another rpg today we're going to talk about sea of stars which is an RPG developed and published by Sabotage Studio for PC and contemporary consoles in 2023. If you have not played Sea of Stars, here's how the spoiler policy goes. It's the same as every episode on the show. We're not going to spoil the story of Sea of Stars for you before the spoiler wall. So if you want to avoid spoilers, you can check down in the show notes and find out when the spoilers begin. Now, a special thing in this episode, in the spoiler section... By nature of some things that happen uh, and the inspirations that uh, inspired Sea of Stars here, we're also going to spoil the plot of Chrono Trigger because this game takes direct inspiration and sometimes lifts entire plot beats from Chrono Trigger. So if you haven't played Chrono Trigger and you don't want to be spoiled, maybe uh, steer clear of that spoiler discussion as well. Uh, but there are some plot beats where I'm like, I can't talk about this the way I want to without talking about what happens in Chrono Trigger. So um, that leads directly into my elevator pitch for what Sea of Stars is. If you don't know what it is, I say the kids who grew up loving Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG made a new game using those inspirations. Guys, what would you say? Yeah, I would I would say the same thing. You know, the game did uh, more so than Chained Echoes hit me in that, oh, I'm 12 years old on my Super Nintendo kind of feel. 
uh, again, you know, for it being like a, a modern JRPG, it did check all of those bot, like the, all of those, like, uh, those reminiscing boxes, you know what I mean? All those childhood feeling playing RPG boxes. So while I do have a lot of stuff, I do want to say about this game. If, if, if you enjoyed the RPGs on like the Super Nintendo or maybe even the Sega or even some of the more like early PlayStation one RPGs, this is definitely going to be up your alley. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that, uh, Actually, a, a throwback to Paper Mario. Um, I think it kind of uh, it's a modernized version. It looks really, really good as far as mm-hmm. how they handle the eight bit. Uh, I think I love the art style of it. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, a take on just a classic RPG with just a little a touch of the freshness. Nothing necessarily new, but I do oddly enough, I don't think it's a take that I've really seen that often as much as I think I should have to be honest. As far as the battle system and things like that go, so yeah, exactly. Um, we're going to get into all those kind of new things like in the battle system and the familiar things as well. Uh, first, want to talk about uh, how long the game is, where we played it. I played this on Switch. I played uh, long enough to get both endings, including the secret stuff, which we'll talk about in the spoiler section. Uh, that took me 37 hours to do. Uh, how about you guys? How long did it take? Oh, man, I should have looked at this. It had to have been like 30 hours. I, I wasn't like you. I didn't. I, I just I didn't have it in me to to do like the new game plus and do like the extra uh, true ending or anything or at least I didn't think it would have been worth any extra time spent uh, on it. But I I mean I did a fair amount of stuff and I tried to find ways to grind. I think I think I was still like in that like twenty eight to thirty two hour range somewhere. I, I I definitely got my fill. Mm-hmm. I was kind of a mixture. I did about. I'd say close to about 40 hours. Some of that are just <laughs> idling, just chilling. But um, <laughs> I try, I'm, I'm, I always do my normal thing. I do a little bit of everything. I try to, uh, of late, make sure that I finish games. So I try not to do, I thought if I tried to go to finish the game, I don't think I would have finished it. So I would, or excuse me, get the secret ending. I don't think I would have finished it completely. So I just went ahead and just uh, finished it out. So I'd say probably about 40 hours, I'd say. Gotcha. Yeah, I was uh, I was kind of surprised because when this game first came out, people were like, this is a 20 to 25 hour game. And then when I played it, I was like, this is not a 20 to 25 hour game. Even if you don't do the extra ending stuff, the 30 hours minimum, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, some of those puzzles were I'm not a puzzle guy, but some of those puzzles I had trouble with, too. I would say a good three extra hours I spent getting mad. <laughs> not figuring out a puzzle, going outside, smoking a cigarette and coming back at it and being like, I'm just going to Google this. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so uh, let's uh, get into our histories, our personal histories with Sea of Stars. What made us want to play it? Did we play their previous game, The Messenger? And then we've already mentioned Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Paper Mario, uh, those types of games. So if you played those games too. So uh, Ryan, I'll kick to you first. What made you want to play Sea of Stars? Uh, to be honest, I was told about it. I remember Bean is essentially uh, Diddy had brought it up as far as it being like a good title, and uh, so I kind of just looked at it because of that. Um, saw the reviews on Steam, uh, saw just the overall kind of like graphic style, and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I had just finished Chain of Echoes uh, probably a couple few months prior to that as well, so um, I was all on board for having like a little, little single player title to be to play on the side. I didn't fit that gap. Something I kind of casually played, um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed that that casualty of it be able to come to it whenever i wanted to just kind of play something on the solo Mm -hmm. and uh back in the day did you play the stuff like chrono trigger and uh like mario and luigi games i played a a little bit of paper mario uh back in the day but i'd say my probably my biggest touch would be ledger dragoon as far as like the overall style uh that looks style overall is a little more like final fantasy as far as a little more grandiose a little more serious but it was one of my favorite i think it's one of the most underrated rpgs actually i wish they would have followed up with it as far as just the uh, the battle system and stories oh, all that stuff kind of fits the the uh classic rpg style but the battle system was always unique to me so that's probably my biggest shout out to to the new style that, that it brought right on uh aaron how about you well i was I mean, I saw the trailer for this game. I don't remember if it was on Reddit, but this would have been like a year probably before it came out. I was, I'd either just finished Chained Echoes or I was right in the throes of Chained Echoes. And I saw this shit and I saw them, I I saw JRPG for the first time that that I can recall where it actually looked like they were climbing up ledges when they climbed up stuff or they would jump off and their knees would bend as they hit the ground. I was really, really attracted or or see them swirling around in the water. I was really attracted to the game based on like what it looked like you could do within the environment that you can't really do in a lot of other video, video games, which I do think they do a very good job of. But I told Ryan, uh, I told Dave, I, I told every person that I thought 
cared about RPGs. I was like, this is my next game. I, what did I just, I just finished. I don't even remember what I just finished, but I was just like, oh my God, I can't wait to get to the end of this because all I want to play is Sea of Stars. Baldur's Gate can come next. Like, even though I know that's probably a Zelda. better game. Zelda, that's right. That's right. That's right. I was playing Tears mm-hmm. of the Kingdom. And I, I, I finally got to a point where I was like, no, Sea of Stars is out. I have to beat Tears of the Kingdom. That's how excited I was for this game. But I, uh, I never played the Messenger. I never played the Mario and Luigi games, even though I have had multiple people tell me I would love them. Uh, but I, I did play C- Chrono Trigger. Now, it's been... A long enough time to where like i don't know if i could pick out specific plot points from chrono trigger without you you know gently nudging me into them dave uh but the battle system i did get a huge chrono trigger vibe from as i was playing it so uh but yeah that was kind of my whole thing i've been watching this game i had it pre-ordered i had it on my watch list on playstation i i was very very excited to play this game yeah um i am like you i've been watching this for a long time because uh, i kick-started this and it was because I played the messenger and I loved the messenger so much. Uh, by the way, an old, old episode of tales from the backlog, maybe like episode 25 or so I should, this is my own show. I should know which episode it is, but it, it's around <laughs> that area, um, about the messenger. So I really love that game. And I liked it so much that after I beat it, I went, I like Googled the studio. Cause I was like, Oh, this game came out a couple years ago. What are they doing now? And I found the Kickstarter page for Sea of Stars, and I backed the Kickstarter like while the credits for the Messenger were still rolling. Like that's that's how much I was like into yes. the Messenger, and then also yep. excited for this one. So I I was real excited for it. I also have a little bit of experience uh, with those inspirations back from the '90s. Uh, I did Chrono Trigger on the podcast in 2022. Uh, that was my first time playing all the way through that game. I played a couple of the Paper Marios. I've played Super Mario RPG, um, some of the Game Boy Advance Mario and Luigi games too. Uh, So I I feel like I have a pretty good basis in like the games that inspired this. Um, And to get into some like opening thoughts before we dive in here, I think that this game does a, a really cool thing with its gameplay, like bringing something new to the table and not... It takes inspiration from those older games, but the combat system in this is it feels like its own system, which is always appreciated in uh, turn based RPGs. Um, On the other hand, I really dislike the story in this game. Um, I I could not connect to the characters. And I, I feel like one of the things that makes an RPG like this, like a JRPG style game, really connect with people is if you get a connection with the characters and with their greater story, then like that's, that's the ticket to making you love those games. The way that like me and Aaron on the podcast, we did final fantasy six and chained echoes games that we love because the stories are great and we connect with them. And the three of us uh, with Ryan here did uh, persona five, another one where like, we like the characters, we like the story. And I just, I didn't get that with sea of stars. I, I don't think that the game is like trash or anything like that, but I I didn't connect with it and it just kind of ended up being all right, you know? Yeah, Yeah, no. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. No, I was just going to agree. I agree with you. And I agree with you, Ryan. Uh, I'm the, I I will go as a step farther to say that uh, when I first started playing Sea of Stars, I was not completely sold on the battle system. Uh, But by the time I had got to the end of the game and all the different uh, elements of the battling system had shown themselves and allowed me to incorporate them and use them, blah, 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 that the battle system kind of grew on me. And not only that, I think it carries the, I think, I think the battle system carries the game entirely. 100% 100% with you, Dave. I just could not get into the story. Every major, there's like maybe two things in the story where I was like, ooh, or like maybe one thing where I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't like anything else. This is why we play these games. They're, they're books, they're stories. This is the kind of game it needs to be. And while I think it excelled in a lot of other things, the story was the one thing to me where I was like, the story is like the one thing like an RPG can lose and make the game objectively worse. Like if the story's good, I can deal with a crappy battle system. If the story's good, I can deal with shitty music or shitty controls. If the, you know, if the battle system is really good, but the story sucks, the game automatically loses three points for me or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm 100% on board with you. I expected a lot, but I, I didn't, ex- I, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have expected a lot from the story because I knew nothing about it and just assumed it would all work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the, after seeing the reviews on it, I did expect a little, 
I don't know. I guess I did expect something a little more grandiose when it came to the story, but it seems like they the the game, the story, kind of flowed the way that they intended it to. They didn't really take themselves very serious. Like the cliches and things like that, that they pointed out is all very much just like making a, a kind of like a fun with traditional RPGs. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like they're like it's all been done. You're not going to see anything new here. Um, and they just kind of I felt like they designed it that way, which I, I appreciate. It's kind of funny at times, but I agree. I think that the battle system was definitely the highlight. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. But the story wasn't anything that I was coming back for specifically, for sure. Yeah, and that that's something that like um, the messenger also had that same kind of meta self referential type of humor in it. And the difference is the messenger is not a game based like on its story. It's a two D Ninja Gaiden like action platformer. Like you can have like the most bullshit or absent story in that kind of game as long as the gameplay is tight. Uh, you'll love that game and. So like that stuff was just kind of like flavor every now and then. But when you transfer it to an RPG and I just kind of like got the feeling that nothing is ever serious. And then like sometimes shit gets real serious, but then like it's not serious anymore. Like an hour later, it, it just like that, that didn't transfer well in, in my opinion, but we'll get into it. We will uh, take a little music break here. When we come back, we will talk about uh, the story, the characters and uh, everything else like that. So in Sea of Stars, you pick between two main characters. Their names are Zael and Valir. They are solstice warriors, children born on the solstice, uh, who are then able to wield the power of the sun if it's the summer solstice or the moon in the uh, winter solstice, I believe. Uh, Zael is the sun warrior and uh, Valir is the moon warrior. Uh, I picked Valir at the beginning. Who did you guys pick? 100% Valir. Long Valir. Yeah, one All long day, blue. Baby. I'm telling you, dude. If if my options are a girl or some teenager with spiky blonde hair, I'm going uh-huh. the girl every single time. <laughs> yeah. I, I I I like Zale, kinda, but I was like, I'm not playing as the teenager with spiky blonde hair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I just just picked her because uh, Valir's character looked more interesting. It's kind of unfortunate because neither character is interesting in the slightest, in my opinion. <laughs> they are they're not silent protagonists. I, I almost feel like they'd be better if they were silent protagonists because yeah, yeah. then, yes. then maybe I could insert myself into it a little bit, but they're not. They do talk and they do have like personalities, but they are cardboard cutouts of people I'm supposed to care about. This is like strike one and two, I feel like for this game story is like we have these main characters that I'm supposed to care about their quests. I'm supposed to care about their feelings, but there's like nothing there with these two. Yeah, mannequins. It's like that anime. It's like one of those reasons why I hate anime. It's just like somebody will say something like, oh, Garl, you silly, you silly bastard. And then it'll cut to Zale. And he's like, ha, 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 And I'm just like, what's, what's, what, what's happening here? Yeah. Me and Dave have talked about the Zale says, ha, ha, ha. That's like 30% of his written dialogue in the story. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, if this isn't like, if this doesn't speak to how much I really, really enjoyed the battle system and running around the map and collecting things like the 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 worse your characters are, the worse your story is, the harder it's going to be for me to give a shit enough to finish the game. But it is a this should be a testament to like why this game is actually pretty good is because mechanically it is just it is a fundamentally sound video game. But it was written by a sixth grader, and that's why we're all mad. <laughs> yeah, a very fun experience for sure. But yeah, the the story was. <sighs> that's the best way to describe it, Ryan. Yes. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll get into a little bit more of like the story setup here, because like I, I actually think because you have other characters with you, and I actually think that they are better and propel the story forward much more than your main characters do, which is a a really weird, like, writing decision, in my opinion. Uh, But Zael and Valir are the solstice warriors. 
they the fact that they're born on the solstice gives them the uh, ability to wield magic of the sun or the moon, and they're the only ones who can protect the world from these monsters known as dwellers. During an eclipse, this lunar or solar magic can hurt the dwellers. Uh, if you don't fight the dwellers, they become these bigger monsters called world eaters, and you can probably guess how that ends. So they are born, they're kind of like children of destiny. They need to fight the dwellers uh, to protect the world and um, eventually, you know, fight off all these other minions of like the big bad in this game, which is known as the Flesh Mancer. So after this opening section uh, where you, you get to know Zael and Valir, uh, they're joined on their quest. They're going out to fight a dweller called the Dweller of Torment. They're joined on their quest by their childhood friend named Garl. Uh, Garl is a cook, and Garl is kind of special because he can't do magic. So you have like these two god children, basically. And then you just have like this dude fighting with like a, a pot lid and shit like that. And for as much as I like your butler for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, kind of, but like, I was going to say Garl's of the main three, Garl's the one that has a character and a personality and a character arc and like character growth and the things that you want from characters in RPG stories. Like Garl's the only good character. Yeah. He reminds me of Alfred from Batman. Like, uh, you mean, <laughs> He's let's be honest, like, yeah. <laughs> like Batman's got a lot, just a lot going on up top. And Alfred is just sound. You know what I'm saying? Just steady. Mm -hmm. That's definitely mm -hmm. the, the situation, except uh, Batman still has a little more personality than these two, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just going to say, like, yeah, Dave, you're right about all the things about Garl having arc and growth and a personality and all of these things. But, like, I mean, so does Marmaduke. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like, like just just because he can't, just because he does do those things, doesn't mean they're not great. I'm notorious in the Discord. Everybody talks about it all the time at Discord. You should go there and find out. People are constantly talking about my takes on Discord. <laughs> but I made it very obvious how much I hate Garl as a character. Now, what Garl does do is he introduces cooking mechanics to the game, which I had a lot of fun with. End of statement. <laughs> It, it's interesting because like you're you're right like i'm grading garl on the sea of stars curve if you put right. garl in another rpg i'd be like yeah he's fine <laughs> somebody cut that guy's head off <laughs> <laughs> not quite like that but he would be fine but like the fact that of your main party members and this extends to later in the game when more people join your party garl is the only one who like takes initiative to talk to people He's the only one that experiences like a character arc. He's the only one who really, I don't know, like deals with interesting things until something big happens later in the game where the other characters have to deal with big stuff too. Like Garl's the only fully fleshed out character. But I do agree with you that if this were, if you transported him to another game, I would be like, oh yeah, that's like the fourth or fifth best character in the party. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. He's definitely like the only non-introvert on the squad. Everybody else is just like, you know what? I'm kind of scared of conversation. Don't really like <laughs> dialogue yeah. or any kind of interaction with people for the most part. Uh, I just, you know, do push-ups and do some sit-ups. It's kind of me. Yeah. There, there, there's a lot of conversations where Garl will, you have to have an important conversation with an important character. Garl's the one who does the talking. And then like, it'll cut to Zale and it'll be like, Zale, dot, 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 dot. And then it'll cut to Valir, ha, 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 or something like that. <laughs> and Garl, and it cuts back to Garl and Garl's like, all right, so like, let's cut to brass tacks. This is what we need <laughs> to do. The, what's the plan here? <laughs> yeah. No, that's very funny. I always tell, you know, you always have that conversation. Like, what would you do if you were in a zombie apocalypse? How would you survive? I would survive like Garl, right? I would be the, di I would be our, our group's <laughs> diplomat. I'd, I'd speak to people, you know what I mean? I'd, that's what I, I can't fight. I don't got magical sun and uh, moon powers, but it, Gar, he's, he's the diplomat. You're right. Literally every main story point, it's just like him jumping in front of everybody and being like, hey, what's going on here? Let's talk to this creature that nobody's talked to in a thousand years or whatever. Yeah, he's like the Rod Weasley. For me, he's like the Rod Weasley, essentially, of the, yes. the group. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I, I hate Rod Weasley. Same. I just wanted to say that real quick. That's it. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of other characters that are kind of important in the story that you meet early on. There is the headmaster of the Solstice Warrior, Moraine, and then there are the mentor uh, characters. They're kind of older Solstice Warriors named Erlina and Brugaves. And uh, 
stuff happens with them throughout the game. Some of the more interesting plot stuff happens uh, with those characters. I think overall, I think that this story like takes a really long time to go anywhere. The beginning of the game, like the tutorial section is really, really slow. You do a combat tutorial like an hour and a half into the game. Uh, Before that, it's just walking around and talking. And then this game also does this thing like on the other end of the game, I think, where you reach a point where it's like very clear to me, like this is, we had a climax and now we're gearing up. We're going to go beat the final boss and we're going to finish the game. And this is one of those games where they're like, no, you're not. You're going to do eight more hours of stuff. And uh, we hope you like it because we're not, you're not going to be quite sure why you're doing it, you know? Uh, it, real weird pacing, I think, in this game, coupled with the fact that for a long time, this game, the story didn't seem to be about anything. It was just kind of like a Saturday morning cartoony adventure. And then like it introduced some stuff and then like it didn't camp out long enough or something like that. I'm just like really disappointed by this as a as an RPG story, especially one that took me 37 hours to play. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the uh, same thing for me, dude, is it's like. And, and, and I, I still put the time in, I, I, I still put the hours in, I still enjoyed pieces of it and stuff like that. But we, we can talk about the story and the characters and the pacing and all of these things all day. None of it matters in the grand scheme of how I feel about this game because I've completely shut out that part of it as being part of Sea of Stars. I'm like, if I if I think about these things too much, it's going to make me hate the game. Like, I, 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 I can't focus on the terror because... I, I never would have finished it if it was that bad. So I, I don't want to have like this giant shit fest about this game because there are parts of it that are good. I, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I was, I was profoundly, I was so excited for this game. And I was profoundly disappointed by the, the result of the game. Any other game, like any other RPG, I would have been like, you would have been like, yeah, let's go get the true ending, see the story. I want extra content. But at, when I got to the end of this game, I'm like, what what extra content would I even give a single shit about? You know, so we we could we could beat this to death all all night, but you know, at at the end of the day, it wasn't like it completely ruined the game for me entirely. But it, it's a it's a huge problem. It's it's the biggest problem this game has. So I would agree. I wasn't as hyped. So in in general, me going into the game, I was just kind of ex, you know enjoy looking for a like you said it's fairly shallow as far as overall game time so that I could beat fairly quickly and just kind of enjoy myself and go on and it ended up being that for me it kind of fit that I wasn't expecting anything grandiose but um I did I guess I'll, I'll agree to the extent that I was also not very impressed with the storyline um and if it wasn't for the fact that agreed that it, <laughs> the game was so enjoyable the experience that they gave you outside of that was so fun uh yeah I would have also probably not finished or super rushed it uh, as the best way for me to say it. I did a little extra here and there, but I wouldn't have done a single extra thing if I, if it wasn't for that. Yeah. I don't want to like have this be like a, a total shit fest without mentioning some stuff that I did think was cool about the story. I, I think that this game has some interesting ideas about like the nature of going on big adventures like you do in this kind of RPG, you know, v- Valir and Zale are these, you know, magic wielders. They're the most powerful people in the world, basically. Uh, And then you also have Garl, who's just a guy. And so a lot of times in that situation, you would be like, well, hold on. How can Garl fight alongside them without getting in any bad situations? And uh, Sea of Stars, to its credit, is like, uh, no, actually, some bad shit's going to happen to uh, Garl. For example, in the first hour of the game, Uh, you go and like fight some monsters in like this cave, you sneak out. It's, it's like this, you know, you're, you're kind of rebelling, sneaking out, having a good time with your friends. You go in this sealed off, like forbidden cave and there's some monsters in there. And one of them fucking like attacks Garl and like basically destroys one of his eyes. And so I'm like, oh shit, like this game has something to say about, (laughs) you know, people getting in over their heads and stuff like that. There is some other stuff later about like, the nature of being these children of destiny and how people deal with the expectations put on them and stuff like that. But in the grand scheme of the story, I didn't think they leaned hard enough into that. Like I said, I spent a lot of the game wondering if this game had a point, like if the story had a point at all. And 
when we did get there, it was either too little too late, or it was like, we're going to introduce this cool idea and then never bring it up ever again. Oh, yeah. Like, I... I don't want to talk about that if that's a spoiler. It's a spoilery thing, but there's the huge thing about the story that just bothered me. But what I will say is you're right. Like, Garl loses his fucking eye. Like, like, right? It's like the first big action you see in this game. And I was like, oh, damn. This game's taking little children's eyeballs, dude. Yeah. This is going to be <laughs> awesome. This is going to be maybe what I want out of this game. What I got from Chain Echoes, you know, uh, is it being a little bit more adult. And then, like, that was, like, the most metal thing that happened in the whole game. That was like by far the most violent and sadistic thing that happened the entire game. <laughs> it's like, yeah, take a little kid's eyeball. All right, now it's just rainbows and puppy dogs for the rest of it. I'm just, I, I'm with you. I, I could not find. It. Like, I'm sure there is a point, but if, but if there, if there was a whole point of the story, or like you said, by the time we got there, I didn't care. I just, I was, I was close enough to finishing the game where I just wanted it to be done. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring that stuff up in the spoiler section for sure, because to its credit, again, there are some cool ideas in there. I do want to talk about those, but not right now. Yeah, I definitely don't think that uh, – the best way to say it is the game is so is very, very good. I would say it's, it's great, but the story is not, by any point for me, the driving force. Yeah, it, it'll be a story that I – like, I, I'm not going to take this story with me in my day-to-day -day, uh, like a, a lot of – RPG stories, I'll, I'll just kind of sit around and think about some games and be like, man, that story was really good. Or like this moment was really impactful. And this game just doesn't really have that kind of lasting appeal as far as the story goes. But um, I do want to talk about some good stuff. We have uh, been fairly negative so far. So we're going to take a music break. We're going to come back and talk about uh, visuals and sound. So uh, let's talk about the way this game looks first. Um, I think this game looks excellent. It's really, really colorful, uh, really great kind of modern pixel art. One of those games that like, you know, it, it's it's inspired by those like Super Nintendo titles, but like this could never have been on a Super Nintendo. It looks way too good, but uh, really, really incredible looking game, I think. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I got, I got a whole like a... Uh legend of mana like vibe from it like a watercolory like storybook style art style um that was in with all games like this is always the allure for me to jump into them like it it doesn't look like a super nintendo rpg it looks like a playstation one rpg Th that's when those start to it kind of reminds me you know a little bit of legend of mana a little bit of star ocean second story um we're, we're with the art style where you're getting more than ju just pixelations i think uh watercolory is the best uh real word that i can use to describe it but yeah i i, I was totally into it i mean they they did a lot of good things with the graphics too like you get out of water it looks like you're wet you, you never saw that kind of shit on playstation one you know you jump in it's got like a realistic splash uh i, I th these little things are like what i look for in games like this i always talk about how the first time i saw link walk up a stepladder in uh uh, Ocarina of Time, it blew my fucking lid open because his legs were moving up and down the ladder. Like, you know, so I look for little things like that. And this game has a lot of little things like that that work really well. The the style of the game is what attracted me the most. And it's and they do a really good job not only of having like a really, really pretty like setting for each of the places that you go, but I also think the world map is really cool as well. I think they do a good job with uh, making the islands that you travel back and forth from not look too much like a Super Mario World game. Uh, but like they, they really like the, the one thing I can think about, there's a sleeping dragon that like rests on this giant Island you go to. And every time you go past it on the world map, it's breathing, it's coming up and down. It's got the little snot bubble coming out. Like, Hey, I, I, <laughs> I it, like, I, I love that. It was very quirky. It was very cute. Uh, and that was good payoff for me. The, the graphics were what I expected and I, I, I think they did a really good job with them. I, I enjoyed them a lot. Yeah. I think that they basically took, uh, eight bit the overall 60-bit style and just pushed it to as, as about as best as you could make it look it literally the 
the world almost felt alive, like you were saying, as far as the dragons, everything felt so charming. Mm-hmm. Um, it was fun to be in the world and traverse it and do everything they had there was, was really a, a very enjoyable um, and, and fun to be in. I completely agree. Yeah, um, I, I played this on my Switch OLED and the OLED screen really made like those neon colors like pop out and look really, really great. And um, Aaron, you mentioned like along the lines of animation, I want to shout out the animations uh, in the game too for just being like excellent, excellent pixel art animation for all the moves you're doing in combat. Um, oh, they have man. a ton of personality. Like I'm thinking of like when Sarai like goes out of that portal and kind of like tosses her dagger up in the air and catches it, and stabs, you know, it's uh, like the, the animations in combat, they have um, unique animations for swimming for every character, like, based on what that character is like without spoiling too much that I thought was like, this is great. Like I, it, they made me smile. Um, so props across the board, as far as like visuals and animation goes, I think. It took me way too long <laughs> to figure out that everybody had not only swimming animations, but climbing on walls animations too, yeah. like, or, or walking a tightrope animations. It took me a long, long time to figure out that like they were, uh, do that everybody had their own different one but you're right about the uh battle mechanic thing dude it was it was super sad like even when i would get annoyed with some of the battle mechanics because i felt like they, they kind of took a little bit too long sometimes just to pull off an attack that you're going to do maybe two times a battle you're right they're very cool and then i don't know if you want to talk about this now but when you start getting ultimate attacks like all of those are like very very well animated they take yeah. you outside of the what, what the game actually is and actually give you like a like a 3d like stratosphere to you know engage in these and they do things like uh they they have little cutscenes like you know where it'll show them in like an anime style like it's it's yeah, it, yeah. It, which is also very very cool they they do a good job of like presenting you with this world and then finding ways through the animation to take take you out of it a little bit uh but I, I I liked them all in the bat. Like I said, the ultimate attacks specifically blew my fucking lid open. <laughs> like I remember seeing Zale's ultimate for the first time and just being like, "Yo, what in the hell is that?" Like uh-huh. <laughs> could use a little bit more of that on the world map or whatever. But I ain't mad. <laughs> the uh, music in Sea of Stars is credited to Eric W. Brown, uh, who did the music for the Messenger under the alias Rainbow Dragon Eyes. It's the same person though who did the Messenger OST. And um, famously, this game has some uh, outside contribution from famous composer Yasunori Mitsuda, who did the music for the Chrono series and the Xeno series, among many, many other credits. Uh, What did you guys think of the music? I, I, I don't I don't really I, I mean, I, I don't really have a lot of thoughts. I mean, I don't think any of I don't think it's like chain echoes or any of these other like and i i'll stop stop with those comparisons right now <laughs> there, there there is not I, I i i don't know it nothing ever really like jumped out to me as i was playing the game you know what i mean there wasn't a a theme or whatever that would pop into my head i'm not saying the music's bad or anything like that but i just feel like I don't know. Maybe there's just like a lot of things that aren't super memorable about this game to me. I mean, I I pl- finished the game two weeks ago, um, and I'm sitting here struggling to think of a single theme. I'm I, I'm like legit, like kind of like I, the game took me out of it so many times with just like what it was that I I don't have a finer appreciation for everything else that went into it. Um, I I don't think the music was bad by any means. I think it was very good. I think the I thought the battle theme was uh very good. Uh, I, I I really like the sailing around in the ship music. But other than that, I just think it just kind of I, I I don't know. It just kind of fell into background noise for me. I mean, when you have to traverse a map and then leave and then go all the way back, like to me, a lot of the game I felt like I was rushing to get back to areas that I had already gone to. And mm-hmm. to its credit, that is like exactly what it was like to play those RPGs and stuff back then. But mm-hmm. as an older gamer, you know, I wanted to be quick, 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 quick. So it, it almost felt like I was rushing around over the map so often with, between so few destinations that it kind of just got lost in the background because I was almost like, I I, I don't care. I just got to get out of this area as quick as possible. So I can get to this next area. So I can get to this next area and so on and so forth. Not that it was bad or anything. I just don't think it was very memorable. Yeah. I actually would here. I would actually disagree. The, the music was a bop to me. There's actually yeah. a few times where I would uh, just be sitting in an area. The music was hitting. Ariel 
uh, my partner would come in and mention like the music is hitting and we would, it would just be sitting there chilling. <laughs> but I can understand again, because of how you, you, the game was more or less, you just try to do the best you can to kind of progress. Um, but still the music was, was hitting for me, especially from the eight bit style. Uh, some definitely, definitely I noticed, uh, and I enjoyed myself quite a bit. Like I said, it would be something I would have in the background, maybe something on my playlist, even a couple of them. So yeah, I enjoyed the music actually quite a bit. Yeah. Something interesting just came to my head. Like I think back to older RPGs where, you know, I associate music with story beats or music with characters or something like that. Like specifically thinking of Final Fantasy or Chrono Trigger, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles, I associate music with like big story moments and stuff like that. And I don't in this game, I don't really associate music with moments. And it's probably because I don't, I didn't connect with the story at all. So I didn't get that effect, but I do agree with Ryan that the music fucking bops. I, I loved it. Um, this was no surprise to me because, like I said, Eric W. Brown did the music for The Messenger, which has one of my favorite game soundtracks of all time. And uh, I didn't mention in the um, story setup section, but this game is set in the same world as The Messenger was set in. And so they remixed some songs from The Messenger to be instead of like driving 2D action songs, they're more like laid back RPG world map type songs. And they were great. Like the remixes were awesome. Um, I couldn't really tell Mitsuda's contribution. Um, I, I just couldn't really pick them out, which could be a credit to just two people coming together and forming like a cohesive soundtrack. Uh, but when, when I heard he was going to be a part of the game, I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like I love his other work. And then I played the game and I was like, I couldn't tell which songs he did or not. And also uh, recently at the time of recording, Mitsuda actually gave an interview or like a press release or something where he said he's not doing any more work like this, where he just kind of comes in and contracts on other people's uh, soundtracks because he doesn't like how people can't tell the difference. That was like one of his quotes. So I don't know if it was like a direct response to Sea of Stars, but uh, I, I thought that was interesting, kind of lines up with my experience here. But I thought the music was awesome. Um, the battle track was great. The going around the world map without spoiling like gameplay mechanics for late in the game, that song is awesome. Um, there were some moments like some real big like visual spectacle moments that had kick ass music too. But like I, this could could be a soundtrack I just listened to outside of the game. I think it rules. I think you made a really, really good point about like uh, about the first thing that you said about like not having specific music collected to plot point or connected to plot points because you don't really give a shit about them. And you're right. When you look back at like big moments, like in final fantasy six with the opera scene or in, I mean like, dude, I, there might be character themes in this game, but if, if there are, I, I never really noticed them or they didn't get played enough for them to get stuck in my head. But I, I think you put it way more eloquently what I was, or you put way more eloquently what I was trying to say, at least in terms of mine that I don't think, think there's a there's a lot of memorable music to me because i don't think it has a lot of memorable plot moments i i think that's a really good point i'm not trying to detract from the music at all but i i think you are saying that the way i want to say it better <laughs> i know that garl has a character theme it's the one that goes that's garl's oh, yeah. theme um, oh, no. <laughs> but i don't think I, I i can't remember if Valir and Zale have character themes. They're barely characters, so I don't. Yeah. So they barely have a theme. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, their theme is just like a, a a couple of like snare drum hits or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> it's the Burger King commercial. <laughs> uh, I agree. I think that because right now the first thing I thought of when you were mentioning that it was I just immediately started playing the Gold Saucer music from Final Fantasy VII, and the amount of hours again I could play. I mean, every note from that in my head right now, but I couldn't necessarily do that for a game I just finished probably like a week or so ago uh, from though, even though I did enjoy the music, but you're right. There weren't specific points in the game where there's so memorable where you like the music just also went hand in hand with that, um, unfortunately, but I agree though, still though, the music was in. Yeah, it, it's it's a good soundtrack. It's it's catchy. It's, it's awesome. Um, I just, it, it's interesting how I often come out of these RPGs like really, really associating specific music with specific parts in the story. Like I, I just recently finished Final Fantasy X again, and there's so many moments in that game where like 
the plot and the soundtrack are like in perfect concert with each other and i just yeah it, it's not something i pull from this and it's probably because i didn't like the story So the gameplay in Sea of Stars, we'll talk about the battle first, and then we'll talk about the out-of-battle stuff after that. Uh, you do turn-based combat in Sea of Stars, uh, no ATB, so it's not like in Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy or something. It is like real turn-based. You can actually sit, take as much time, and think about what you want to do. You have three party members on the screen at a time, and eventually you will collect I believe you, if I remember right, you'll get at least five, maybe six characters in your party. Um, and you can switch your party members out free of charge at any time, which I always appreciate that. Um, one of the big things about this battle system is that it brings something from the Mario and Luigi games, uh, which is timing attacks to do extra damage if you press the attack button right when your attack lands, uh, or if you press the button right when someone hits you, you'll block a percentage of the damage that they do. This is a, a big feature of the game. How did you guys feel about this? I loved it. I love shit like this. This is Super Mario RPG incarnate. What I, and, and I, I will not talk a whole, whole lot about the battle system because I, I, I just feel like it's clearly the best part of it. But I thought it was cool how every single enemy had like a different way to trick you into not being able to block their attacks. Like the first thing that you fight in the game just comes up, its arm goes in the air, it comes down, boom, easy to time the attack. But as you get further on into the game, it's like a guy, will, <laughs> it's like a guy will like jump in front of you, raise his right hand, raise his left hand, swing his left hand halfway, and then come at you with his right hand. <laughs> <under>. <laughs> You're like, bro, how the f how the fuck am I supposed to block that? You did six moves before. You it's like what my dad did when I was a kid, and he would like wind up his fist like he was gonna punch me, and then just kick me in the kneecap. <laughs> like I, I, I thought that was very funny because I was just like, oh well, if it's gonna be a time to tag battle system, I'm about to fuck this whole game up. Uh, but it wasn't like they are constantly challenged. Like it, it, sometimes it would get to a point where a character would come up and trick me and I wouldn't be able to block it like three times. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to eat the HP. I don't care. I'm, not even gonna, I'm getting so frustrated not being able to do this. <laughs> I'm just going to let him have the free hit and then I'm going to hit him back 18 times harder when it's my turn. But I, I, I love shit like this to me, like the, the JR and we've talked about this before. If you're going to have a modern day JRPG, it can't, or a turn based battle system, even like it's got to have some sort of nuance that separates it from other things, or at least keeps it from the, keeps the battle system from becoming stale. I think at the very basics of this battle system, adding the time hits and the time blocks were really good for this game. It, it keeps you engaged when not other parts of the game are. So I, I loved it. I had a ton of fun doing this stuff. Uh, so yeah, very cool. I just, the amount of time something tricked me and I couldn't block it. I was like legit, like Arrington, like crushing my controller. Like, why can't I not fucking block the <laughs> water droplet enemy or whatever? <laughs> yeah. I, oh man, I could, like the, the, the battle system is superb. Um, I'm honestly genuinely shocked that more games, RPGs, especially haven't picked up the style because it's such a simple thing to do and adds so much detail, so much, uh, context to the, to the fighting it just makes them each fight seem unique fun uh I, I, honestly i don't know how more games haven't done it but this game did and it was, it was again it was a blast um uh, the attacks all the attacks are fun to do they look spectacular as you're doing them which makes it even more fun to do so um but yeah i was getting i was definitely getting my shit pushed in several times by the enemies uh because they were definitely catching you with <laughs> they were catching you with hella hezies uh some faints in there <laughs> um and, and the way they, the characters look even just each animation was so unique and different. Um, I, I don't know. The, the, being really kind of covered the best, the, it was super, super fun to do. And even getting <laughs> constantly uh, uh, shaken was was pretty funny uh, and surprising. Because, again, each fight you got in, you're like, all right, I'm going to get you this time. You you literally beat the brakes off me like five times around, but I'm going to get you at least once. And I never did on some of those. But regardless, it's just the fact that you always had an opportunity to do so. It was super engaging. Uh, the battle system was fantastic. Yeah. The the time tits, I, I like them too. It's it 
in some games, it kind of feels like a, a cheap way to make you pay attention during combat, right? It's like, well, if you time it right, you'll do two extra damage or something like that. But the thing that makes this one work is that you're not just trying to time your attacks right to do a bit of extra damage. A lot of your attacks and all of your special abilities will have, well, no, all of your attacks even will all have some kind of like property to them. So like Valir's attack does blunt damage, Zale does sword damage, uh, Valir does lunar magic, Zale does solar magic, and there's other stuff that gets introduced. Uh, enemies will kind of start to prepare spells. Uh, this is called the lock system in the game. Uh, spells are special abilities, and they'll show you like, maybe they'll show you one like hammer icon, one moon icon, and one sword icon. So if you hit them one time each with like those types of damage, uh, you will break those locks. And if you break all of them, you'll interrupt their spell or their ability that they're trying to do. And this is like the crux of the battle system is, especially during boss fights, is trying to break these and prevent these big attacks. And if you can't break all of them, you'll reduce the amount of damage they do. So you're always incentivized to try. Um, I thought this was like awesome and in a real weird twist compared to a lot of RPGs, I thought that the regular enemies were like strangely balanced. Like the regular enemies were often really, really fucking hard. But then the boss fights, I thought like throughout the game, the boss fights were perfect. They were like incredible puzzle challenges for trying to like remove these locks. I thought it was great. Dude, I, I love the lock system in this game. They, my only, but my biggest qualm with like, and this is, and, and this goes back to like what you were, uh, like when you said that you could switch characters in and out, like uh, without any like cost or anything like that. Mm -hmm. This was a big part of it is because like sometimes you'd have three characters out there and you're like, well, none of my characters have an attack to break this lock. So I'm going to bring in this person that I rarely ever use or this person that I rarely ever use. So it, it also gives you a reason to use a bunch of different characters. Like I found myself in boss fights switching out all the time. I would switch out the main characters if the boss called for me to break a certain lock that they didn't have. Uh, but I, I guess my only complaint with this is this this is when I think the battle system is at its best is in the boss fights. I think I think and you've talked about it ad nauseum in the group chat and on Discord how good the fucking boss fights are in this game. They are, but they they are easier because it, it, it's a formula to beat a boss. They have so many locks that you got to break. It's almost like the fight is you keeping them from doing their big attacks because a lot of big attacks in this game will fuck your life up if you're not careful. And yep. I, I didn't think this game was particularly hard by any means, but there were a couple bosses where it was just like, oh, if I don't break this certain thing, I am absolutely fucked. I can't fight my way out of this or whatever, even with like the food you got. Uh, however, like I, I think this is when the, I think the boss fights are when it's at its best. And if I had one complaint, it's that one the, the 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 ultimate attacks and the locks didn't really I think play a huge role until maybe like the last thirty five percent of the game. I wish they would have incorporated yeah. a little bit more into the regular enemies. But I also think you know on the reverse side of the coin, that's why the regular enemies were hard was because sometimes you didn't have to break their locks and keep them from fighting. It had to be like a battle of attrition, you know, outlasting them instead. So I, I like that balance. But to me, my favorite part of the battle system was the lock system and the ultimates and breaking those things i just didn't think they incorporated it enough in in the game outside of the boss fights i mean i know there was but to me it was like for every you know one fight i get into with a regular enemy that has a uh, complicated lock to break i got into 15 more fights where it was just me attacking somebody and them attacking me back yeah sometimes i would just literally stun lock my bosses uh, and i, I would really say that i agree the bosses were I was literally just excited every time a boss was coming up. Couldn't wait to see the design, what the attacks were, whatever the case is. But unfortunately, with the attacks, didn't matter because I was shutting them down. Okay, I'm talking. I'm, I'm talking. I was going to some boss fights where they weren't getting an attack off, bro. Like yeah. I was just systematically making like a surgeon, just dismantling these niggas. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it, to be honest. And I think the one thing that really kind of separated from the regular fights is, I don't know, when I got into a boss fight, I was ready to prove myself. Like I was ready to take it personal, you know, for me. But with the regular fights, it's kind of like you know, I would have locks that came up that I probably could have broken, just didn't care to. I was just like, I don't care. I'm just going to hit you a couple times and move on. Uh, so I think that was the main difference when it came to just the regular fights. The boss fights I enjoyed using abilities but i didn't really care so much about breaking those locks didn't feel like the damage was enough although sometimes 
they would <laughs> like me would say they would just they'd rock your shit um and you're like okay i have to respect those locks uh which i enjoyed i do think they could have maybe elaborated a little bit on that uh but overall the the battle system is is a lot of fun i enjoy the fact that uh there's a little thought process to it one of my favorite things is the 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 characters I'll, I'll touch on that the fact you could switch out on them kind of like final fantasy 10 except you have a little more freedom which i think is fantastic uh just the feeling of having characters and just like that slight bit of anxiety just like i, I want to use this character at least a little bit that they could exist but it's like you have a, a certain setup that you really enjoy but they allowed you the freedom of being able to switch between characters and not feel like you're not able to enjoy all aspects of your other characters that you do enjoy you're able to get a little taste of everything because of the fact that uh Every turn, you didn't have to go in a certain order of turns. You could use one character, and then if you wanted to, you could technically use them again, as long as it's within you know the the parameters that the game allowed, which I really liked. So it gave you some some freedom to to really enjoy the characters, um, and just the battle system that it offered. All the abilities were so cool, um, and everything you do, I think, really meshed well. I mean, clearly you could tell that their highlight was like, I want to make sure this battle system is fucking clean, and yeah. it really showed. Yeah, the characters are interesting because they all have like defined roles with the type of damage that they can do. Uh, like I said, Valir can do blunt damage and moon damage. Sarai can do sword damage and poison damage. Uh, Garl can just do blunt damage because he can't use magic. Um, but Garl can heal people too. So that's good too. Um, so I, I liked how a lot of the bosses especially would incentivize you to use all of your characters. There were still MVPs for sure, but they you were incentivized to use every character, get like really familiar with every ability that every character got. And I really appreciated that. So the way that these kind of attack and turn-based and lock system works also is there's a turn order, but like it's it's unlike any other game I've really played they'll put up like a turn counter on an enemy and say like, this enemy is going to attack in one turn, this attack, this enemy is going to attack in two turns, this one's going to attack in one turn. And then you get one move with one of your characters. And then those two it will tick down to zero. Those two enemies will attack you, then you'll get one turn. And then that other one will attack you. What I ran into a lot of times is like, I'd be fighting like four enemies. They would all throw up lock puzzles like they got big attacks coming and they're all going to attack in two turns. And so I can't break those. Like you can't break all of those. And since they're all going to do those big attacks, like I got party wiped often in those situations. And so that kind of felt bad because it felt like, like the lock puzzles are presented as puzzles for you to solve. And then often they would throw them up against regular enemies where it was like unsolvable situations. And that felt bad, but like that was an early game problem. Once I got to like the mid game and especially the late game, I was like, I got a handle on all of it. I got um, used to using Sarai's skill where she can like delay an enemy's turn by like two or three turns, Bro. which was like fucking Fuck. MVP As, skill. Dude, Fuck. MVP move, MVP yeah. boss move, move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like I did figure it out, but the it was interesting. Like the early game was the hardest with this. Um, and it kind of also felt bad because at the beginning when they're tutorializing this, they told you like, Hey, if you don't get the timing right, like it's cool, it's fine. Like think of it as a bonus if you do get the timing right. And then like I'm fighting the final boss, and it's like you have to get the timing right. You cannot miss. Yeah, that was a lie. That was a hundred yeah. percent a lie because yeah. if you weren't, <laughs> you were getting scraped. So true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and here's the thing that pisses me off the most is like some of these like complicated locks. Like you you can really only hope to break them on, in a short amount of time if you do like a combo attack right so this is this is my biggest problem that one that i found kind of frustrating is like you would go into a fight and immediately like a lock would pop up and you you don't have the amount of turns to do it unless you have a combo but you can't get a combo unless you build it up using all these skills so it's basically like the game saying like hey fuck you you're gonna take this hit no matter what unless you kill this person which uh, a lot of the time isn't feasible you can't just like straight up kill somebody within two shots even regular enemies a lot of the time so that that was my biggest thing was i, I where i kind of agree with you like I, at least the thing that was very frustrating for me is they would throw you locks that you literally had zero chance of of unlocking you had to take that hit so while you had 
um, Sarai's like little, uh, I, I don't remember what it was called, distraction or, or, or whatever it was called. But yeah, uh, Disorient? Yeah, disorient. disorient, yeah disorient right uh you also had valir's lunar shield which i u- would use a-, a lot of the time too at the beginning of a battle like in lieu of using an attack for valir to get some damage in or to break a lock if i saw something that i knew was going to hit me i just use a lunar shield right off rip and just not have to worry about it so you know i it does find a way to balance itself out but if i had like one qualm with the magic or with the, with the magic system with the battle system it was that sometimes they would throw you things that you just you you could not do. You had to figure out a way around them, and whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know. But I also I found myself frustrated some some boss fights, even you know some boss fights where it was just like the boss and like three or four other things you had to worry about, and you're like, well, I can't break three of these things locks. What the fuck am I going to do? I'm going to take some damage right here, no matter what. Yeah, you know, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know, but I I found it kind of frustrating. Yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's the way it's presented because like there's no RPG where you can just avoid damage all the time. It's it's not something you should expect in any True. game. But the way it's presented as a puzzle, and puzzles are to be solved. They're given to you to be solved, and then it gives you these puzzles that are unsolvable. Feels bad. Like just purely because of the way they're presented. But like I said, that was a first half of the game problem. Um, in the second half of the game, I felt like it was a lot more manageable. I had more skills to help deal with those situations. Um, your characters learn skills as you level up, and your characters will also learn combo attacks like in Chrono Trigger. Um, those attacks and those skills, if they're not like utility things like um, delaying an enemy's attack or healing or like that lunar shield you talked about, Aaron, those skills and combo attacks are all about what locks are on the screen, what damage types do they need, and what abilities do I have that give those combinations of damage types. And then if you time those correctly, you might get an extra hit uh, to break another piece of that lock, which again, like later in the game, like late game boss fights, like mandatory, you have to get those. Otherwise, it's going to be much, much harder for you. Yeah, one thing that I noticed, I'm not sure if you guys notice as well, is that by each portion of that lock that you break, the damage is then subsequently reduced. Yeah. So even if you don't break the locks, it's still good to, if you can destroy, you know, most of them, you're still reducing the damage significantly, which I thought was pretty cool as a way to kind of do seamlessly kind of bridge that where you didn't feel like, okay, I didn't get the whole thing, but at least I'm instead of taking the 200 damage, I would have, I'm taking, you know, 150, maybe 125, which is significant. So yeah. I like the fact that they managed to, to kind of meld the things and make it still, you wanted to at least attempt it in a way. Uh, so I, I did like that aspect of it as well. I had no idea that was a thing. It's, Dave on, said the, it earlier. it's on the screen. Yeah, no, I know. Dave said it earlier <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? And then Strange is talking about it right now. And I'm like, okay, so. <laughs> That's a thing. Yeah, yeah. So I just yeah. took it then. If uh, so, if you if you break like all but one lock, I think the max uh, damage you can like reduce is like 40%. So like they'll do 60% of what they were going to do to you. So, I mean, that's helpful. It's not nothing for sure, especially in boss fights. Sick. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah. those bosses, those shots were were definitely deadly. And it was a difference of me getting one shot sometimes or, or not for sure. Yeah. Um, and for everyone out there who would be like nervous about a timed hit system, like maybe you're not able to do the timing or something like that, uh, they do give you these items that will like let you adjust the difficulty in a granular way like you can equip this item that basically means you get the timing on your attacks every time you don't even have to do it Um, there are some that do the same for defense there's one that i used that just gives you like a more clear visual indicator of when you get the timing right like there'll be like a shooting star that shoots off when you get the timing right like a sound effect and i had that on the whole game because i'm you're constantly learning the timing for your own attacks. But like, like Ryan said, every new enemy has different animations, different timings for their attacks. You have to learn those. And just like that extra visual indicator helped me out a lot when I was learning. Yeah, that was the best relic. I I only rolled to the entire game because like I already thought the game was pretty easy. I wasn't trying to make it any easier on myself. Uh, but I used, yeah, that I, I believe they were called relics. The relic that gave you the shooting star, uh, 
the shooting star graphic when you timed it right so you you did get a better idea of at least your attacks maybe not so much the other enemies but where your sweet spots are and then i use the exp boost one that i found uh just so i could it, leveling up really didn't matter a whole lot in this game <laughs> but ju- but ju- just so i could i could say i was higher level than dave at because the end. yeah because because <laughs> this game won't like won't let you grind so you it have to let use you the grind. relic yeah. that's two games in a row i haven't been able to grind dude i'm fucking fiending like a vampire <laughs> over, over there just itching and shit <laughs> ashy larry <laughs> uh ryan do you use any of those relics I did actually. I I used the same ones that you did. I used the at one point once we there was a certain character introduced, where I felt like I was kind of struggling with uh, the attack. I introduced the one where they would do it automatically, so that I could see the timing, like just so I could understand when to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that didn't work. So uh, yeah, I eventually <laughs> just used the experience one because I did feel like the experience was a little little grindy as far as that they're they're giving out to. They seem a little stingy with it. But yeah, as you play later on, it didn't feel like it was as necessary to do so. But uh, the relics, the idea of the relics is very cool. Just the fact that maybe you weren't that into the battle system, maybe they found it a little too difficult. They could simplify a little bit more for you, so you could you know, maybe push the game a little bit. Uh, my Ariel, my girl, she was thinking about playing it as well. Saw some, <laughs> some of the difficulty at the very, very beginning, like you were mentioning. I was like, eh, maybe I don't want to actually try this game. And I mentioned the relics, and she's like, oh, okay, fair enough. So it will bring in some interest to people that uh, may be a little put off by the difficulty at first. Yeah, it, it's interesting you mentioned the experience. So, like, this is a game where you don't level up very often. Like I can't remember what level I finished the game, but it's like maybe level 20 or something like that. So they, they are really stingy with experience. I I think it's because they don't want you to grind. I think they want you to like be on a tight level progression. So I, I appreciate games that don't make me grind. Like don't, don't force me to let me grind if I want to, but like, don't force me to do it. But what did happen is um, sometimes you'll beat a boss and you'll get like one fifth of a level up. And that feels really shitty to like literally beat one of these like world eating bosses. That's like, you know, th- this thing's going to eat the entire world. And then you fight it and it's like, congratulations, you you need to beat four of those to get one more level up. And I'm like, all right, that. OK, OK. OK. So here's my big question. Right. So like, let's say so when you. OK, OK. This bothered me. So let's say you have 50 experience left until you level up and you find a boss that gives you 9,800 experience when you win. Does <laughs> that extra experience carry over or does it stop and start anew from that point? I wasn't clear. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't does, clear either. It does carry over, but yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank God. Oh my yes, God. There were so many times where I could not find anything else to fight <laughs> so I could get that level up. And then I was like, fine, I'll go to find the boss. I was like, there's 10,000 experience now, the fucking drain right there. <laughs> I okay. Should, all right. It, it, right. it bothered me because like you don't get experience when you beat the final boss because you just go into the ending. But like I guarantee you, if you did get experience, you would get like one third of a level up for beating oh, the yeah, final boss. Sure. And I was like, that feels terrible. <laughs> they do, and even with the experience boost relic that I had, it wasn't great, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine how you'd have felt if you didn't have the experience boost on, honestly, because like it gave you another, what, a little 0.5 essentially of what you yeah, were already? I, I would say probably two levels higher than I regularly would have finished the game at, yeah. Uh, at least four or five for me, easily. Yeah, other aspects of the gameplay here um, that I think are really cool are stuff you're doing outside of battle. Um, you are like running around on the world, on the, sorry, not the world map, but the, the level screens. And uh, this game has a bunch of stuff like hopping over gaps, climbing uh, ladders and like tightrope walking and stuff like that. It, it's all really simple. Like it's all like one button press or no button presses. So like, it, it's not like, it's not you can't fail and like fall down a cliff and die or something like that right. but there, there's a really like just kind of calming satisfying aspect to like 
just kind of hopping over these like rocks or something like that or hopping down ledges and stuff I, I again i think it's animations and uh just how like dialed in that stuff is but it's really fun to like run around explore these levels like maybe you'll see a treasure chest you can't get there and you have to like puzzle out how to how do i get there from you know where i am down here uh using these you know light exploration abilities i thought it was cool yeah, I agree. I think it was one of the uh, coolest things about the game. I mentioned earlier how uh, how it was one of the things that allured me to it was seeing you in this style of an RPG interact with the environment. They they do a very uh, good job of that. Same way, uh, you, you know, with like uh like, like like finding ingredients to cook with and stuff like that. Like those are constantly spread out throughout the map too. So like when you go into a level like. It, it, it almost is like a puzzle in and of itself because each level does have layers to it. And some of the solstice shrines, which are these puzzle shrines that you have to do, they they do take perspective and and things like that into it when they're creating these puzzles. So I, I, I also think that that is one of the game's strengths right here. And like, you know, you, you talked about like, oh, you know, it's aesthetically pleasing to see you jump up a cliff or to jump into a pool of water and sink down and then pop back up and blah, blah, blah. But they do do a good job of incorporating it into the game to make it like necessary to find like you said to find treasure or to find ingredients or secret areas or extra puzzles or whatever like i said in the game where i was like so put off by the story it was nice that it did the little things well enough to still keep me invested like in the same way that i was invested when i saw the trailer for the first time yeah i agree i think that uh yeah as simple as they were they just added a a best way for me is just a, like a little charming personality to the game. It made it fun to do. Is it, te- not nothing necessarily tedious, but as small as they were, uh, yeah, it, it did add a lot to the game overall. Um, it was just again just fun to be in the world and to traverse for sure. And it looked like you said, just looks great. The eight bit style is just something I'm always been a, a huge, huge fan of. I'm biased to that, uh, and I think they did a fantastic job with it. Yeah, I mean, it it definitely helps that like. The levels you're going through are gorgeous. I love the music. Uh, again, just kind of hopping around, doing light puzzle solving. N- none of the puzzles like really gave me any issue, but like it's all stuff that like you have to just figure out a little bit of stuff to you know find that treasure chest or uh, open up a new pathway to go. So that was always fun. There are a couple other like bonus you know gameplay things here. There's a fishing mini game. What do you guys think? Did you go fishing? All the time. That's the easiest money you can get in the game, man. Plus, also, I'm kind of an achievement hunter. There were a couple achievements in the game attached to it. Uh, But the best meals that you can create in the game, I feel, or at least like most of them, involve fish. And then if you need quick, easy money, sell 50 fish fillets. You probably got enough money to buy whatever you want. The fishing minigame was just okay, though. Like, it wasn't wasn't anything groundbreaking or whatever, but it's easy money. Yeah, your boy got his fish on any time. I I mean, if there's a fish... (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 I love fishing bro i don't know what it is i don't care how simple it is but the mini games bro if, if there's fishing i'm there um and this was no different i fished the i mean i cleaned the, the lake out i was selfish about my you know, I, mean, I was taking everything no. uh, so yeah I, I got my fish on make sure I, I got all of them you know, all the styles all the kinds and um yeah i was i was merciless about mines i, I loved yeah. it <laughs> just fucking depleting the ecosystem yeah <laughs> merciless about mines like excuse me sir i need to fish this week to feed my family i'm sorry i didn't hear you as you yeah. were really another uh, i'm sorry i i have some herbed fillets to cook yeah <laughs> i was just like mm-hmm. and just continued about mines but <laughs> uh i i did some fishing from time to time like i, I think it's an all right fishing as far as as, as far as fishing mini games in rpgs go like this one's like decent there's some like real bad fishing mini games out there, but this, this one's okay. There is, if you're going for like the secret ending, there is a fishing final boss that fucking sucks. Like I was so goddamn mad doing that. Like it is, there was nothing in this game as difficult as the fishing final boss that you have to do. It was, it was fucking terrible. And so like in just the true ending, or, yeah. or, or were you, did you, you actually, talked about that and I didn't have to do that when I played the game. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause you didn't do the secret ending. Okay, cool. But, so wait, did you have to, is it about reeling it in or are you actually fighting this? Both like both it, it's the fishing mini game, but it's like a thousand times harder than any fish you've ever had to catch the rest of the game. <laughs> like it's, it's fucking terrible. Even, even oh, with all the upgrades, it. I assume and everything. 
Uh, well, I didn't have any, I didn't have upgrades because, uh, again, I was not connected to the story. So like you get your little town to upgrade and stuff, yeah. but I was like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go to town and talk to people. I don't give a shit what anyone has Fair. to say. Yeah, no, so, no, that makes sense. <laughs> so maybe my, maybe my, my gear was, uh, underpowered or something, but like it was, yeah, you uh, went out there with a stick and a string rough. basically. So that's, yeah, uh, I was, I was there, the fucking, trying to catch the, the white whale with like, yeah, like my bare hands basically. <laughs> <laughs> with your fingers as bait. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That's uh, actually so, swag. That's tight. Yeah. So, so like, I, that made me mad, but like, if it was like, oh, I got to gather some ingredients to cook because I need some food because food is your your healing potions in this game, then it was like, yeah, I'll pop over to the pond, I'll fish a little bit, it's okay. I wasn't mad at, it. I wasn't mad at it. It was like, not like the fishing in fucking near or Fire Emblem or something that's like the worst fishing out there. This is okay. Uh, the other mini game to uh, to talk about is Wheels. It is like the uh, oh, think like your your triple triad or your Gwent type uh, mini game to play. You can play it every time you go to an inn. Uh, Wheels is kind of difficult to explain. You kind of just have to like see it, but you you basically you play at a table. It's played with like these board game pieces. You, I don't know how it works. You, like each character like brings their own fucking like wheels to put on the spinner, and you spin them, and you can like get points to level up your two kind of heroes that you set up on the board, try and do damage to the other team's uh, castle or some shit like that. <laughs> Difficult to explain, but I did think it was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed wheels. I played it every new town. I was like, all right, let me find that wheels table time to get me a new piece or something like that. I, I did to an extent. I liked wheels. So the best way I can describe wheels is it's like Yahtzee, right? Where you're like constantly rolling dice to try and you know, in Yahtzee, you can like roll some dice. You can pick which ones you want to save and ultimately like build your own lineup of five dice. That's kind of what wheels is. Yeah. Um, you, you can roll three times mm-hmm. or you can spin the the wheels three times and you can pick which of like the five or six things that you want to keep for your your final move yeah yeah so first off like shout out to the yahtzee great game uh but yeah i'm i'm i I never played it enough to like like i i I never beat everybody uh i never got all the pieces but if i went somewhere i'd play a couple games against the champion if i didn't win after three games i was like peace i don't care if anybody had like the the healing like wheels piece i was like nope not winning this game I'm, I'll, I'll get frustrated and kick a hole through my tv before i finish <laughs> this shit. but i i liked wheels I, at first i thought it was weird it's kind of like gwent you just you, you kind of get used to it and every once in a while you you get the you get the thirst for it and i i i don't have any i, I don't hate the game i'm usually not into like you know, RPG, like side card games or side dice game or what the fuck ever. But I thought this one was pretty fun. I, I had some fun playing it. There's r- really no strategy involved. Like it's Yahtzee. It all comes down to a dice roll, but it, it was fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm just dumb, uh, but I, 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 I didn't play. I mean, a single second <laughs> of wheels. I mean, I, 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 the tutorial, bro. I'm to listen to me. Listen, to me, they, 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 they show that tutorial, bro. And I was, I don't know what maybe it was a moment. I was just like, I don't know what the fuck any of that was. <laughs> but I was just like, click, and I, I, I literally, I literally never saw a wheels table for the rest of the game. Like, I just not, not one time. I mean, not once. Okay, not even as a tutorial. I was like, oh, I'll try it out. I did not, I didn't even try it out. So I have, nothing, I have nothing to say about wheels besides the fact that when you, fr- again, I'm not sure, I, I might be dumb and I I, I I feel challenged, but regardless, uh, yeah, I don't know. That first introduction was just not, it was not it for me. This is not a bop, dude. It, it they wasn't don't explain Final Fantasy VIII, shit to you. No. It wasn't Final Fantasy VIII trading card game for me. You know what I'm saying? No, dude. So I, I'm with you, man. Like the tutorial, I played the tutorial and I was like, so like tilted by how they don't explain shit to you. They were like, here, read these like two tutorial cards that will try to explain wheels to you. And they're terrible at explaining the game to you. So I, I, I played the tutorial. I got my ass kicked. I had no idea what was happening. I, I think I went in the discord server and was like, yo, what the fuck? And then <laughs> like two or three more games. And I was like, oh, this is uh, this is actually there's like Aaron said, there's no strategic depth to wheels. You just kind of spin and pick the good things that come up. And uh, so it's like, I thought wheels was cool in the game. I played it when I saw it, but 
this is I like pretty pretty confident in saying like you could never play this against another person. It would be infuriating. It's because it's all just like how the shit spins. Like there there is a little strategy to it, but the strategy doesn't exist without them sweet, sweet Yahtzee spins. Shout outs to Yahtzee guys. Way, <laughs> way better than wheels. I don't Yahtzee. think I've ever played Yahtzee, dude. Oh, Dave. I you also gotta, have you gotta yeah. played Yahtzee. But I also <laughs> didn't play wheels. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right. That tracks. Uh so I think this is a good time to get into our wrap up thoughts before the spoiler section here. So uh, what we always try to answer in this kind of wrap up section is if you have any kind of final thoughts about the game, um, kind of thoughts about maybe it's kind of impact out there, but also uh, who would you recommend this to? What type of person? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's fairly obvious if you like RPGs, you will find something that you like in it. I feel like I say that in every episode that I do with you because we mainly just sit here and talk RPGs. Uh, I will give you a forewarning for the first. This is the first time I've done an episode on Tales from the Backlog that I actually had a lot of negative stuff to say about it. So I will say if you like RPGs, it's probably a safe bet that you're going to like it, at least to the extent that me and Dave and Arrington to Aaron Ryan did. Uh, but you should be forewarned that there's not a lot of character de- character depth or progression. There's not a whole lot of substance to the story. And I cannot say enough bad things about how terrible I think the dialogue in this game is and how it specifically like moves uh, within the story format. So if those are things you can easily deal with, or like I said at the beginning, you're young enough to where those things don't matter to you. This, I, I, I think this is a good pickup for you. But I, if story's as important to you as it is to me, like or it is to uh, is to Dave or to Ryan here, then I, I, I think you should be a little bit weary about it. Like I, I do think it has a lot of problems that are only made up for by how good the game is in other places. And if those other places aren't important to you and the story is, you probably aren't going to like the game. And I, I think there were points uh, where I was at in the game where I didn't really like it very much either. But I stuck with it, and I, I, there's no story payoff, but the boss fights are fun. The uh, the aesthetic is fun. I The music is immemorable, but I remember it being very good. So, I, I, I mean, the, the, the kind of game this is for is for people who play RPGs, but it should come with a warning label. Hey, if you expect this out of a game like this, this is actually what you're getting, and you should know about that before you, you know, spend the money or the time you know invested into it uh i think that i probably had have the best way of coming coming being introduced to the game where i had no expectation other than i heard that the game was good and so i didn't come in there expecting anything other than just to try to enjoy the ride and i think that's exactly what the game is designed for they and the, even the even the storytelling the dialogue they don't really take themselves seriously within that i think that's kind of made apparent pretty quickly and but the thing that they do take serious, which is the battle system, I think like that does shine. So I think that if you're the person that hops into an RPG, puts on the easiest mode, and really just kind of wants to enjoy the ride as far as the story goes, I do think that you'll probably be let down a bit here. But if you're, again, you're just kind of a casual person just trying to enjoy the experience, RPGs and otherwise, I, I don't think that you'll be disappointed. I think it's got its ratings for a reason uh, because it is fun to play in the end. It's just a fun game to just simply have the control of your hands and enjoy the game. So I, I would recommend it to pretty much anybody that enjoys RPGs as well. But if you're a person that really essentially you are a story driven person, you'd be reading hella books, you like books, you may not want to run this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that like, especially with the story, the th- I'm kind of surprised that all three of us are as negative on the story as we are, because like, there are a lot of people out there who who did really enjoy the story. So it, it just, you know happenstance that all three of us didn't seem to like it that much so like despite the three of us not connecting with the story know that there are a lot of people who really did like it so even if i'm the type if i'm i'm going to go ahead and kind of echo what you guys said like if you want to play a damn near 40 hour rpg because you want to connect with characters and like a a plot line that kind of you know compels you to keep playing I don't think this game has that, but there are people that do. So like, as always, if you're listening to this show, you're more than likely an adult. What's up? You can make your own decisions. Uh, You know yourself. And this game's on Game Pass. It's on PS Plus. Like, you might not even have to pay extra money for it. So yeah, give it a try. Like, I think the gameplay is really strong. I think the music fucking bops. It looks great. Um, It's just, I was like really let down 
I, I think that if this game were 20 hours long, I maybe I could have enjoyed like that playful kind of innocent tone that it takes for most of the game. But the fact that it was almost 40, like I said, I don't want to play an RPG, a story driven genre and ever think to myself, does this game have anything to say? And I did feel that uh, throughout this. So this is like a, like kind of a, just know yourself type of recommendation. I, this won't be on my top games of 2023. I didn't really enjoy it that much, but that being said, critical reception has been really high. So as I mean, should go without saying, but know yourself, know your tastes. Why not give it a shot? Especially if you have game pass or something like that, you have nothing to lose there. Yeah, I was going to say, I did want to try to say one thing real quick. I, just, I, yeah. I, I actually have a hot take was if I got, I fuck with your boy, Garl. Uh, I wanted to come in and say that because I, <laughs> okay. I know that he wasn't well received. But, Scorching. But, 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 but Garl is my nigga. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I want to say, first of all, he took a shot for baby girl off top. I mean, he took the shot. She could have taken that. Who knows? It maybe hit her in the back of the head, fucked her head all up. He took it. His eyes fucked up. You know, it's cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's got the food on point. You know what I'm saying? He got everybody. I mean, let's be honest. It, it, the game was tough, but once that, that nutrition, you know what I'm saying? Once he had the yeah. gut bacteria <laughs> on point was introduced, the game became much easier. So if you wouldn't fuck with Garl, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. And again, Garl really set the tone as far as, again, the only really dialogue that was in the game was, was Garl. You know what I'm saying? Anything that was really worth saying. I'm, I'm just saying, Garl was, he was low key the goat. But again, he didn't. <laughs> the boy didn't have magic. You know what I'm saying? He looked a little goofy. Shit. I mean, he used a pot lid for his weapon. I, I get it. But I'm just saying, Garl deserves a little bit of respect, considering that he was the only part of the game as far as dialogue and character that really carried over anything. I'm just, yeah. I'm just saying. I'm with not you. only will I not show Garl any respect, I know where you live. It's less than five minutes away, and I'm gonna come over to your house and spit in your fucking face, dude. <laughs> I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of you talking about Garl. <laughs> <laughs> I did say a lot to me about Garl. Again, he he did disagree. <laughs> But we didn't talk about it long. So I, as far as I'm concerned, that's a win. That, so, was, that was a buildup. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I, I could have been way more annoying about this. That's true. He let it go. So again, Gara was cool. The story, uh, I will say this as well as the story wasn't, I mean, I played a lot of RPGs and I don't know, it's it's kind of hard to surprise or, or really impress at this point, I think as far as that goes. Um, so I think they kind of played it for what, for towards that but um i didn't hate the story by any means i get i was just, i would simply say that if the if your whole purpose of playing the genre is purely for the story which mine is not i enjoy several aspects of the genre uh that i don't think that this is going to be maybe your your highest on your list but again like like dave said i think there are aspects that you'll still enjoy um and be able to appreciate um so i mm -hmm. i definitely highly recommend this title uh, i'll say that because again as far as my boy being hater okay but even someone who hates as much as he does still able to finish the game and enjoy it i mean i really do think that speaks volumes considering that i must be honest i feel like that, uh, <laughs> the, that the story aspect is probably one of the biggest things we talked about here today and still despite that we all finished the game and the one thing i will say i think my biggest negative for the story itself is the fact that i don't think that the true ending should have been hidden behind the continued play while i think that if yeah. that was introduced that was the main ending i think it would have been a good top off to the overall experience uh in my personal opinion so i think that after seeing the true ending i was like uh, dang i think that was kind of the one of the best parts of the, about the story quite frankly if you see the true ending so i think yeah. that aspect is kind of missed that's a good point to uh, to bring up here. And obviously, I'm not going to talk about specifics about what happens, but I I think the standard ending that you get like kind of sucks. It's like a, a big letdown, pretty anticlimactic, in my opinion. And then you have to go through like five to ten hours of collect-a-thon completionist bullshit to get the real ending, uh, which like... When I say real ending, I mean like there's this is clearly the canon ending. This is the ending they want you to see. This is the ending they're proud of. But you have to do a bunch of stuff that I hated doing all this complete you, you guys you guys know me. I do not collect stuff. I don't 100% games. I don't want to collect all the goddamn seashells. Mm -hmm. But this game makes you do that stuff to get the real ending, not like not like some secret Easter egg ending. This is the canon ending. And I'm glad you brought this up because now I'm mad. It, it, <laughs> is, it, is, it is ridiculous how unfulfilling the standard ending of this game is. And then to hide the canon ending behind collecting all the seashells 
doing a bunch of like there there's one person to get a seashell from this person you have to give them 40 fucking pieces of fish to get one seashell from them and you have to there's what there's like 60 seashells in this game oh i'm mad now uh oh. <laughs> but this this is it is ridiculous hiding their intended ending behind all of this stuff that's usually reserved for like the platinum trophy sickos like this sickos. is ridiculous yeah. yeah yeah and i and i would even uh i would even take it a step further and say that like if the story were better throughout the whole game maybe i would have been more inclined to want to see the true ending when i don't give a shit about any of the plot basically the entire time and now it's like okay so we're gonna give we're gonna throw you the true ending the one we're proud of the one that is canon but you got to do a, a collectathon like you said i'm like i'm sitting here like I, when i got to the end i'm like fuck that You're like dude. i like Baldur's no. game three is waiting for me yeah like. dude no <laughs> if i would but but like more importantly if i would have given a shit about the story up to that point or if I really wanted to know what happened, I would have done the collectathon just to see it, and it wouldn't have bothered me a little bit if the story had made me think that that extra ending was going to be worth it. But to me, I was just like, "What could it do? That what, what is it going to be so good that it changes my entire perspective of the entire story?" There's no way it does that, it so doesn't. I don't care. No, yeah, it, it no, doesn't. I, yeah, I watched the true ending. Like you know, I I know it sucks. I watched the Golden Pelican restaurant scene. <laughs> doesn't do shit. Do you know what you got to do to get to the Golden Pelican, bro? <laughs> it's a no, lot of nasty shit. A lot of gross. Yeah, a lot of gross stuff. I used a guide, and this is this is the last thing I'll say, and we'll move into housekeeping here. But I used a guide to follow to do all the stuff to get the real ending and i was mad the entire time i mm -hmm. was doing it because i was like I, I have to comb every fucking inch of this place to find these things that i didn't find before uh it sucked and i, was I gonna, can't believe you did it dude. i was gonna say to me and diddy did talk that if there's an aspect of the traversal brother the, the fact that you it was such so tedious low-key to go back to certain points and you've, it, it just felt so pointless. The enemies are completely useless at that point. If they yeah. had just introduced an easier way to fast travel, just a little bit back and forth, I think I'd have been more inclined to finish the game and get the true ending. But the fact that you had to do it all pretty much manually, essentially, till a certain point, it's just, it just, I, I was not about it. Yeah, I'll say uh, this is the last thing. But the thing that made me want to do it was that people told me that the gameplay aspect, like, you know, extra bosses you fight are are worth it. And they're good, but are they worth it? I don't think so. Like nothing to me, nothing is worth collecting all the collectibles. I don't want to do that shit. So yeah. All right. We will, uh, we'll, we'll take a second. We'll chill. We'll take a deep breath and we'll do some housekeeping here before the spoiler section. Um, like I said, at the top of the show, Aaron is uh, one of my co-hosts on my other podcast, which I shout out every show. It's called a top three podcast where we do top three lists. We draft weird topics uh, and we have a good time. Ryan's been a guest on that show before. We talked about top three video game sidekicks on that episode. Looking forward to having you back on the show sometime. But uh, if you yeah, want to listen to a top three podcast, you can find a link down in the show notes. It's a good time. We're also joined by uh, two guys we found on the side of the road, Alan and Bloodbath, for that podcast. We we got to name them because we found them. <laughs> so right. we named one a human name, Alan, and we named the other a Bloodbath because he's cute. It's ironic. <laughs> yeah, they're bums for sure. For exactly. Sure. Um, so that is a top three podcast. Uh, please consider listening. It's also rolled into the Patreon for Tales from the Backlog. So if you support Tales from the Backlog on Patreon, you want to get some of those perks like voting on games that I do on the show. Uh, you want bonus episodes. You'll also get bonus top three content. You'll get the uh, pre and post show banter that's normally cut out uh, too spicy for the general public. And you'll also get uh, the ability to vote on polls for that show uh, from time to time as well. That's patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson. If you want to uh, support that way, Dave's across the world uh, appreciate the support. We also have a discord server going. We have uh, at the time of recording, we have a dedicated Sea of Stars channel as a kind of game. We call it the new hotness in the Discord server. That'll probably be replaced by upcoming stuff at the time of recording, like Spider-Man and Alan Wake. And that might be replaced by the time we get to this episode's release. But we've always got dedicated channels for new releases in there. Uh, the Baldur's Gate channel will probably be going for a while as it 
takes people the rest of their lives to finish that game. Um, <laughs> we'd love to have you come join the Discord server. It's a good time. And as always, the final thing is, if you have not left a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Podcast Addict, that's highly appreciated. It helps when people search Sea of Stars, it helps them find this show. So that would be uh, much appreciated. The three of us are going to take a break. And when we come back, it is full spoiler time for Sea of Stars. the three of us are back and we're talking spoilers for sea of stars and we're not going to walk beat by beat through the plot Uh, i kind of mentioned before that i spent a long time in this game wondering if this game had anything to say and then it did bring up some things that i think they are trying to say here so i want to kind of camp out and talk about those things Um, i I mentioned before like I, i think this game started to open up an interesting theme about you know, the the children of destiny and how their lives are all laid out before them. And it's it's a pretty shitty life. It's like you're fighting monsters your entire life, like dangerous monsters. And this starts when Brugaves and Erlina um, betray you, basically. Um, they were, uh, just like all the kids, they're kind of dropped off by this great eagle in the village. They're raised to be these warrior monks, basically their whole life. Uh, their kind of decided fate is to be these warriors who just fight these incredibly dangerous monsters all the time. And I, I thought it was interesting how these two betrayed you kind of like at the halfway point in the game. You you fight, you beat a dweller, and then all of a sudden Erlina and Brugaves betray you and they join the other side, the side of the Fleshmancer and those four uh, acolytes, they called them. And then later they kind of like give you the the background for that. They show you some flashbacks where Erlina and Brugaves are talking about like how scared they are of this life that's been chosen for them and how they don't want to do this. And then there's another flashback when they were kids, when a bunch of solstice warriors went out to go fight a dweller and only one of them came back alive. And I think that kind of like planted that seed. So when they found an opportunity to like literally the only way they thought they could get out of this life was to to join the evil side. I thought that was an interesting like beginning of a theme, you know, of like, we have these heroes of destiny. What happens when they don't want to do it? So to me that what that screams, <clears throat> cause I, I think that is like, I'm going to put on my storyteller hat here. Like, I think that is such an important thematic element to have in the story about characters like those. Why was that not shown through the main characters? Yes. Why was, why, and, 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 and that, that was huge for me. Like there is, and they might've lightly brushed it off at a campfire or blah, blah, blah. But it seems to me like, Brewgraves and Erlina kind of had the right idea of what I want out of a character. I want there to be some sort of questioning. I, I, I want them to think about, you know, the grand scheme of what they're doing. You know, why not Brewgraves and Erlina, the ones being killed when they went to fight the Dweller and the main characters had to see that? It would have added so, so much more to them. And instead, they give it to two, they give that really cool idea to two characters that are barely in the game at, at all so i i do think it's a it, it's a good like plot beat I, I i do like that idea and i like the idea of these people questioning you know what they've been raised to do but to me it almost felt like the two main characters valir and zale in the story were robotic they don't question anything they blindly follow and it would have been such a cool thing for their characters to have to experience something like that instead of giving it to two other characters who it seemed like at the end of the day the only reason that that happened was to make them the bad guy and and i i I just think that's too strong of a thing for uh you know them to have to deal with for it to just end with like oh now they're the bad guy the one thing I wanted to bring up that always like bothered me is like you get to that point in the story <clears throat> where Erlina and Brewgraves like Brewgraves is that you say it? I I don't even I, I think I said said it Brewgrave or something like that <laughs> some stupid some stupid as shit Joke but there's a point 
where, yeah, where the Fleshmancer comes and he agrees to give them their wish or whatever for helping him, you know, do whatever, whatever it is he was doing. And uh, then you never see Brewgraves again. Never. And they make such a huge thing about how, like, Illyria, is that how you say her name? Or Ur- Erlia? Erlina. Erlina. This is how little I cared about the characters. I played this two weeks ago, but there, there's, a, there's a clear between Brewgraves and Erlina. Like Erlina's the one that wants this, and Brewgraves has is empathetic towards what he's doing towards your main characters. So Erlina, she goes off and gets these ultra powers for helping the Fleshmancer betray you, and then Brewgraves just kind of goes away. And the whole time he's like, maybe what we're doing isn't great. We're having this. You know, he's having this like internal struggle of like how he feels about like, you know, betraying Valer and Zale, betraying his friends, betraying the Order. And so they both go their separate ways. And you see Erlina later, you never see Brewgraves again. He's like the one guy that questions the question and they snuff it out like a candle. Like they they never go back to talking about him. I thought for sure that he was going to come back at some point and do something. Is it, is it true ending shit? Is that why it you're is, pointing your face? It is in the true ah, ending. That um, makes me even so, that makes me even more mad. Yeah. It's, it it's, even it, it's dumb. Mad, how, Cause it, it, it like ah. you said, it's, you have a, a hanging character resolution that you get nothing in the standard ending and then in the true ending, but in the true ending, it's not like obvious what's going on. So like in the true ending, um, Erlina, goes down and like talks to this red devil looking character. That's Brugaves. Brugaves became this devil character. You can kind of tell because the armor is the same. And someone else told me that's how I figured it out. But uh, the, the key point for that is that that, that devil character is, that is the villain in the messenger. So that was kind of like a showing what happened to Brugaves and tying it into the messenger a little bit more. So I, like I said, this was like the beginning of exploring a theme, but then they, they just like, they just fumbled it, I think. So like you said, Brugaves goes away. You don't get any resolution. He said that he wants to forget all of this, that that's his wish is to forget. And so the Fleshmancer with his, you know, monkey paw, uh, wish granting sends him off, turns him into the devil, and he's the antagonist in the messenger. Erlina goes on like this power quest. She she's totally cool with being made like the right hand man or the right hand of the uh, the fleshmancer. But it doesn't make any sense to me because the whole reason they wanted to do this is because they were scared and they wanted a peaceful life and they didn't want to fight stuff. So now she's going to accept unlimited power from the fleshmancer and be like the Fleshmancer's, you know, first in command or some shit like that. That doesn't make any sense to me. It, it's, it's, it's why you got to throw it back and give Valer and Zale that story point. And that's the other, that's the other point. They, Valer and Zale do not go through any inner turmoil about their role as Solstice Warriors. The only turmoil they go through is when Garl dies. But as far as their destiny... Like they never go through this struggle that Erlina and Brugave should or do when they should, because they they should be like, oh, why did they, why did they do this? Uh, doesn't it suck that our friend just got killed because of this quest that we're on? Like, would maybe maybe it makes you question if it was all worth it? Like they don't go through that shit ever. <laughs> no, these guys are just mannequins. Is the best way to put it. They get just, <laughs> um, literally just kind of girls, basically just. Uh, background singers is the best way to put it but yeah i, I don't I, I say didn't really think of it to that depth honestly as far as the story goes but now that you guys have said that yeah that's that's definitely a fair point seeing the brew graves just kind of go through that little thing i wanted to i really just wanted to beat the brakes off them after they betrayed me which i really didn't feel like i really got yep. that sense of just gratification either um but yeah I, for being able to get a hold of them but i i mean if i had at least gotten that true ending uh, and the canon ending essentially where you put it just basic on the, the basic ending where they have to go through all the shit just to get it and saw you know which that, that kind of the image you know you kind of leave that to imagination like oh that's probably brew graves I, I don't mind that but the, again the fact that they just had, had to do so much shit to get there it's still just it's like who cares you know what I'm saying any of the stuff that you could have been at least kind of put to the imagination you just because it gets lost because who really wants to go through that tedious stuff for uh, for that again I, I just didn't 
So, um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't really think about that, but that's a good point. Uh, there was not much, <laughs> they didn't think about a, a single thing. They were just the most, just like, yeah, like, fuck yeah, dude, let's be fucking solstice warriors. I'm ready to just, I'm ready to fuck shit up. It's basically, they're, they're just soldiers. They're ready to fuck shit up. And they did that. I mean, so as far as things are concerned, that was pretty much all they cared to give a fuck about. But yeah, it was, it was unfortunate to see that uh, Brugge's really didn't get brought back up. And, and for like, your point about Relinia, she just was, <laughs> she went from like, I don't know, her whole fuck personality was just kind of fuck. She was just like, damn, the motherfuckers died. Like, fuck all of this, I guess. Yeah. But I wouldn't mind just start fucking shit up too. Like, I'm ready to start. <laughs> I don't know her personality. That was a good point. I don't know what the fuck her whole thing was. Yeah, it, it was just like how confident and eager she was to just join the fleshmancer and be you know the the you know a weapon for the fleshmancer basically when her entire purpose up to that point was finding a way to like get out of this like fighting not lifestyle. be a weapon yeah she yeah. went from one puppet to another well, puppet she could, and- even more shallow than that she was just like all i care about is brew graves as all as long as brew graves is cool and then yeah. that's even worse though loki because you don't even know what the fuck happened to my boy and then you just find him and he's just basically like some he just looks like some weird fucking goddamn he was just like did you even do anything for the boy then did you did you guys get what you wanted in any way did you protect him at all that was she was real, real stuck about the boy. And then, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Actually, I think this is the story theme that they set up and they actually paid off uh, really well until they undid it um, because they, they just had to, they had to early in the game. We talked about Garl losing his eye and kind of like setting up this idea that some people are not meant to be in these traveling, adventuring parties in these RPGs. Like they did just, you know, Garl's just a regular dude. He fights with a pot lid. He can't do magic. He he's he's just a regular guy, and he gets in over his head early in the game. He loses an eye, uh, but he's still up for the adventure. And he's he's you know he's willing to venture with his friends. This is one of those you know uh, the power of friendship type games for a while. And then um, I I actually like what they did here, where Garl jumps in front of a, a an attack that was from the fleshmancer that was meant for one of the solstice warriors i can't remember which one um and garl gets mortally wounded and i think this is the best part in the game where basically the only character that i cared about was now like mortally wounded they had the courage at the time to like they they say like you know we have stuff to do and in your head, you're kind of thinking like, oh, are they going to figure out a way to save Garl? But nope, he just dies uh, when they do the stuff. It's also a like, all, not one-to-one, but like real, real close to uh, the way Chrono dies in Chrono Trigger when uh, Lavos kills him. Uh, except it's more interesting in this game because Chrono is a silent protagonist and Garl is an actual character. Uh, so I thought that was cool um, how... They take one of the characters, They he does his like heroic act, he jumps in front of this thing, and then they have the courage to kill him, basically. But it's kind of an, after that, it's kind of an indictment on the writing of Valir and Zael again, because they mourn Garl for like 10 minutes of game time, there's a funeral, um, then they set sail for the Sea of Stars, you have this like amazing visual thing of traveling the sea of stars. Then they get to the next level and they, they, they like never talk about Garl again until the true ending stuff. Like they are not reminded of the person they lost. They're not like questioning their journey because their best friend just got killed. It's kind of like, well, we, we Garl died and we had the funeral and now we're moving on. And now we're, everything's cool again we just don't have garl now there's like a cool little thing you can do if you i don't even remember what it's called moon cradle i think where you can go back to that city and you can visit garl's grave and they it's not like a cutscene or anything but they can talk about it so there there are ways to trigger that um but i i i'm I'm with you know and even with the whole me like hating on garl like you're right what my favorite part of the game is after they travel across the Sea of Stars when they get to Sarai's world. Sarai's world kind of brought a a sense of darkness that I had been waiting for uh, in the video game to actually happen. So uh, 
while like yes now you're relying on your two protagonists to carry the story again when garl's not there i feel like they didn't and the plot of what was happening in sarai's world was enough to keep me interested through the end of that story so yeah like i i i don't know the best way to describe it i I just like i mean i'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of the other two characters in your party's names. There's like R- Rashawn or R- Rasha and yeah, Rashawn and Beast. Be- see, and I, I pronounced it Bist because that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> but like at the same time, it's like we've gone almost two hours and not even mentioned a single one of the other characters in, in our party, man. Like, like I, I, I think that's kind of like an indictment on itself. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I thought the, I, I. I was kind of happy when Garl died just because it was just like, okay, at least we're having like a real RPG moment here when there's not really a lot of those, you know, paced throughout the story. Um, but it, isn't it like in the true ending, like don't you bring it back to life or something like that? You do. Um, before I, before I talk about that, I just want to mention like earlier with Erlina and Brugaves, I talked about like this, this story theme that I think they were trying for of, how being these heroes of destiny would kind of suck and Brugaves and Orlina made their choice to betray them basically. And then you, you have the opportunity here for Zale and Valir to grapple with the fact that like their quest that Garl like wanted to go on, got him killed. Uh, Like their best friend got killed because of the quest that they're on. And it, it felt like another opportunity for them to really like, revisit that theme of how much it would suck but i i just don't think they did i don't think valir and zeal are or zale are um developed nearly enough as characters to like for me to feel any empathy toward them you know but then also they don't talk about this like they erlina and brugaves had these conversations about like how scared they were and how They don't want to go fight these monsters. Zael and Valir don't have those conversations. And it gets wild to me that the two main characters of the game would not talk about like the effects of their best friend getting killed, sacrificing himself for them. They kind of just use it as a rallying cry, but like they'd never have the, those moments of questioning the quest or anything like that to my memory. No, even it almost feels like if you really think about it, just a, it's like it's like yeah, yeah it's kind of a, that's kind of what he was meant to do. He the mother could cook, nigga could really. That's kind of he had a lid. <laughs> you know I mean, like that's yeah, obviously he's gonna die for me. You know I mean, that's kind of what his purpose was, and that's low key kind of what I felt like realistically because yeah, it was not discussed. It's like yeah, that sucks, but I mean, let's be honest, like we're the dope ones, and the nigga, you know, he cooked it, he made a good sandwich. But that's kind of it. You know I mean, <laughs> we told him to get rid of the pot, get a sword, yeah. get, get rid of the pot. He would listen. Yeah. They told him that we wasn't really meant for that life, and he said he was. So, I mean, in the end, it seemed like, yeah, it's like, yeah, you got yeah. what you were expecting. That's the way they played it, which, yeah, it does kind of, in the end, seem a little soulless, to be honest. It's it just like, when the other characters have gone through this, why would you not make the main characters go through this uh, yeah. kind of self-doubt, too? It doesn't make any sense point. from a storytelling perspective. True. Or just make them silent, you know? That's how you fix that problem, and they didn't. They 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 were talking. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, Aaron, you mentioned Sarai's world. I'll, I'll talk about the true ending with Garl uh, in a little bit. You mentioned Sarai's world. This was the part I talked about at the beginning when I felt like, okay, Garl died. Uh, or Garl had this, like, you know, his, his final heroic act is to wake up the dragon to cook the, the world's largest loaf of bread, Hey Arnold style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah hey shout out to Hey Arnold, baby. Yeah, shout, shout out, out. Uh, the goat. Um, but Garl did his last heroic act and then he died. You had the funeral and then like you're sad and then everyone regroups and now it's time to go fight the Fleshmancer and beat the game. But instead you, you go do this entire other section in Sarai's world. There's like, there was a plot twist twist with Sarai earlier where she was like an assassin, but she was also the pirate captain. And then there's a third plot twist where she's actually a robot, which seemed (laughs) completely unnecessary to me it was like you already did a plot twist with this character i don't need another one with this character yeah yeah but like this section here was that section where i was like i felt like i was 
clearly gearing up to go fight the final boss. Like we gathered our strength, we traveled the sea of stars. Again, amazing visual and music during that part. And now like three hours into this section, I'm like, I'm fighting a bird cult. And I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> That's true, bro. Would you, yeah, when you say it like that, it makes me feel like a piece of shit for it being the fav- my favorite part. <laughs> Dude, like, I, I understand it being your favorite part because it, it is that darker part. It's it's uh, it's the future world from Chrono Trigger again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like pretty much. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm with you. By the time I had gotten to that point in the game, I kind of was just like, okay, cool, I'm ready to beat this. Sarai was my favorite character. She was my favorite character to use. I thought she had the coolest backstory. So, uh, even with all like the dumb shit in your world with her being the pirate captain and all this, I still felt like whatever underlying things were going on with her were still the most interesting part of the story to me. So when it opens her character up in this last part i was totally cool with it takes you from like a like a uh, like a standard jrpg fantasy foresty world it takes you to a bleak you know like post-apocalyptic like robot takeover type future area and i thought it was such a weird change of scale in the game like i i really do think the the feel of the game the vibe of the game completely changed at that point too so like i totally get it where you would be like I'm ready to end this game and I think this is over. But to me, like this was the one part of the game that I enjoyed the most was being in Sarai's world and being in that. Like I said, I think, I think chain echoes change something in JRPGs for me where I'm like, Oh, you can do this kind of format and be dark and be, you know, made for adults. And I feel like that was the only part of the game where I ever took the characters and what they were doing super seriously because it did have a super serious, vibe to it but i i understand why you were like ah oh, geez another 10 hours of of stuff and she's a robot <laughs> like, <laughs> but she was my favorite character so I, I was totally all about this world this vibe it i i, I don't know it gave me very I, I can't really describe it but you're you're right it's it's the future world in chrono trigger it's it's darkness you know i i thought that was cool yeah i admit that it did seem super it did seem super fucking random i won't lie i was just like oh okay Okay, well, why are we suddenly doing this? So it, it did seem we're in space. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh, wait, are, are are we done? So it did seem fucking random, and I think that if they had just paced that a little bit better, maybe thrown that in there a little bit earlier would have made more sense. And give you the maybe the overall cap off the flow would have just been perfect. I think if they had that in a little bit earlier. And I also want to say that I was so fucking upset that we were not flying on that fucking dragon, bro. Like I was so but oh, I was yeah. so butthurt. Like the yes. fact that you end up turning to these or these little fucking lazy fucking orbs. They're just flying. I was like, well, we could have been on the motherfucking boy. This fucking <laughs> glide thing. I was so pissed. But that's fine. That's all good. I mean, it is what it is. But the uh, map was too small, man. The, I don't give uh, a fuck, nigga. You should have been. You should. They should have had you out there fucking whipping that motherfucker. You kidding me? I was pissed, nigga. I was like, oh, I, I, I was, uh, I literally would have put my life on it, nigga. I was like, oh, we, I, we are for sure going to be using him you were, as the you way were to fucking it. fly around. Uh, that is going to be sure the way that you travel around. Because I was like, okay, there's some spots you're gonna have to fly around. Nope. Here you are with some some two just basic ass orbs, bro. Orbs too, mm. nigga. I was, I was heated. Nigga. Dragon <laughs> was right there, bro. Dragon uh, bro. was right there. He was the coolest yeah. fucking looking character too. Just, just over there. Yep. Even when he was just breathing, nigga. Just like you said, a little fucking bubble, bro. I was, I was about that dragon. I was like, we bitch, you go fuck with that dragon. I know I'm getting that dragon, but that's fine. Uh, that's it. Is. That's all. Your, your character, your character rides on that dragon in the messenger too. Just uh, oh, fuck. I, so it, it, I did want to ask you this: Does the messenger playing that game enrich your experience, like literally in any way, by playing that first? Uh. Only because some of the area music is remixed messenger songs, and I sure. love the messenger music. Yeah, so I like hearing that, seeing like the title screen of like the frozen peaks and uh, the autumn hills, and hearing that music remixed, uh, that, and then the seeing the the devil that's the bad guy in the messenger at the end. That's the only thing because um, the messenger is not a story heavy game. So I, I'm honestly I'm not sure what I expected. But those things That's were fair. cool, for sure. Cool. I was just curious when you first mentioned that because I didn't play the messenger. It, dude, if you like a, if you like a, a Ninja Gaiden 2D type game, it's excellent. Yeah. Okay.
let's see in in Sarai's world they do give some cool backstory I thought for like what's going on with the Fleshmancer and um, Rishan who was like this archivist this alchemist who uh was kind of like narrating the game at the beginning and then like kind of cool you just kind of like bust into his room and he's like hey what's up i'm i'm the alchemist that was cool but uh a little backstory like the two of them knew each other when they were younger they were friends and um like the the flesh mancer kind of turned to evil and uh the the thing that's going on is that rishan kind of created these infinite timelines so that like a society would be able to rise up and possibly beat the Fleshmancer someday. So like, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I dig that. Um, kind of reminded me of, uh, Jacob and the man in black in lost, uh, like that yes. little dynamic there. It was kind of cool. Yeah. I actually really, really like that part of the game. Like I said, it just seemed, you know, you said it earlier too little, too late with a bunch of this stuff by, by the time he, I mean, it's the same thing with lost too, you know, too little, too <laughs> late kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, by, by the time I was that point in the story, I just, I, I didn't care. Now here's a question. True ending. Do you get to fight the flesh mancer? Uh, yeah, you do. Okay. All right. That's pretty cool. That was another thing that I kind of had a problem with is like you fight Erlina as like the final, as, as like the real final boss at the end of the, uh, regular ending. And it was, not that hard of a boss fight. And I kind of expected the Fleshmancer to come in and, you know, have one final big hurrah. And then I didn't get that. So I was kind of pissed off about it. Uh, but okay, that's, that, that's cool. At least I guess in their canon ending that I did not have the patience to attain. They yeah. at least did something like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, yada, 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 you, you go fight the, uh, you go think you're going to fight the Fleshmancer. And he, he basically says like, ah, I, I, you're, you're below me. I'm not fighting you. And so you fight Erlina instead. Um, I was talking with, um, Chris from retro hangover on his podcast about this. And he said that this fight reminded him of queen zeal from chrono trigger. Um, which I, I didn't remember the specifics of that fight, but you know, Chrono Trigger fans can confirm or deny. Um, but you, you fight her and you, you don't get to fight the flesh mancer. Valir and Zale kind of fly away. They, they beat her and they're like, well, I guess our watch has begun and they fly away and you fight one of these world eaters out in space in this like shoot 'em up section. Did you guys enjoy this kind of switch up at the end here. straight Galaga style yeah yeah I, I did but it wasn't hard enough it was like super fucking easy I, I, I was don't, expecting I don't think like, it was meant to be, I don't think they wanted you to die during this you know yeah yeah I, I wish I wish I could have and then just restarted again like Galaga but yeah no I get it I, I did like it though I thought that was cool yeah I, I didn't mind it either uh, as far as the gameplay was tight but yeah I agree it was clearly just like a little outro yeah and they did a similar thing in the messenger too, with like the final boss and kind of switching up gameplay styles. So like, I think they wanted to kind of do a similar thing here. Um, but this ending, like you, you beat Erlina, the fleshmancer leaves. He tells you like, okay, I'm out of here, but like a great evil is coming your way. You go out into space and you beat its ass in like 30 seconds and then it's over. That's the standard ending. So like, you don't fight the Fleshmancer. You don't find out what happened to Brew Gaves. Uh, well, I was going to say that Garl still being dead is a bad thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's good that they didn't resurrect Garl as part of the story yet. Uh, but this ending sucks. Like, super unsatisfying as a story ending. We already talked about it. But this is why I think it's unsatisfying with full spoilers. Yeah, I, I, my thing, I, I do wish that one thing that didn't really make any sense to me was the fucking relationship between the alchemist and the fleshmancer. Like, were they, were they, were they lovers? Like, it was weird just at the end. Like, he just ushers him into this little area and just follows behind him. I'm not sure yeah. if that's like followed up in canon, but on the true ending, but it didn't make any sense to me at all. He could have, at one point, the fleshmancer says, it's funny because you could stop all this with a snap of your fingers. Like, even though he's just, but you think this is all going to become good or some shit. And you're like, okay, maybe we're going to find some crazy shit out. Nope. My boy just kind of is like, it's almost like he, the flesh is like an old man and he's just like a nurse. He's like, come on. You're like you've clearly, you're, you got, you got a little paranoid. <laughs> you went off and did some weird shit. Let's just take you back home now. It was just weird. <laughs> I just wish they like uh, explain that a little bit more. So I don't know that I thought that was weird. Yeah. The man in black, uh, Jacob thing is, is, is a, is a really, really good, uh, reference point for their relationship. 
yeah, like I, I, I just got left with a bad taste in my mouth. Like not only have I been following this story and putting in the hours based solely off of the, uh, the gameplay that I really, really enjoyed, but then to me it had absolutely zero payoff. At least, you know, to some degree in a lot of other RPGs, they'll do like a – like the end of a high school movie where there'll be like a like a freeze frame and it'll be like, well, Johnny ended up going to the University of <laughs> Northampton and, and played backup tight end. They got a scholarship and now he's a teacher and every like they, they don't say <laughs> shit about the about what happens afterwards. I mean, I know there's the true ending. I get that. I get that. And that will always be the argument. And we've already talked about like why that sucks that you have to go through all that just to get, <clears throat> you know, something out of it. But like. The whole game, I, I had a bad taste in my mouth, and the ending left me with another bad taste. I just, like I said, man, I, I I can just never sit here and be like, yo, I really like this game. I really like parts of it, but I really don't understand parts of it, too. Yeah. One one thing that's cool about the standard ending is so Zale and Valir go out, and like their job now is to just kind of fly around like all the planets and universes and just kind of like keep an eye on shit. And um, they return to like this world. Um, they fly across the sky on Garl's birthday and they, the like old lady in the town was like telling a story to the kids. And it was like, legend says that the solstice warriors return on the warrior cook's birthday. And I was like, that's, that's pretty sweet. It's that's a nice cute. little yep. touch, but it's, it's, it's an unsatisfying ending. But then like that final thing was kind of cute. I liked that at least. I did too. I did too. Good point. I fuck with Carl. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the true ending, um, after collecting all the conch cell, uh, shells, and uh, that sucked. We already talked about that. Uh, what happens is, like, at some point in the regular ending, Rishon just leaves. He just fucking pieces out. And he's gone for a while. And what happens is he he takes you through a portal. After you do all these things, you have to fight some extra bosses which were cool. I liked fighting them. Uh, you have to do all the solstice shrines. You have to get all the seashells. You have to, um, I think you have to unlock like all the shit in mirth, the hometown. You got to do all those lunar puzzles or what are those light puzzles yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And shit too. You had to do all those. Like I didn't mind like the puzzles and the extra bosses. It's just the conch shells that pissed me off. After you do that, Rashawn has like made a portal and found a way to, take you back to the moment where Garl dies. And so you guys remember in Chrono Trigger when Chrono dies and they travel back in time and replace him with a doll so they can save him. Mm -hmm. That's what they do here, except it's beast. Like the, the, the glass yeah, character baby. takes the shape of Garl and like goes back there, takes the hit for Garl. You pull Garl out and then you go dig beast up out of the grave and then you go on your merry way again. And that's that's how you bring him back. And so like the whole time I was like watching this, just thinking like this, the future world, Sarai's world, the way that girl died in the first place, this is all just straight up ripped out of Chrono Trigger. This is not inspired by Chrono Trigger. This is Chrono Trigger. And it left a bad taste in my mouth where I'm like, can't you like think of something else? Can't you put your own unique spin on this? Like this is, it's better than in Chrono Trick because like putting Beast in there is more interesting than finding a doll that looks like Chrono. But this just like rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, have your own original idea, especially this is like a, a climactic triumphant moment in your story. And like, you're, you're not even like, it doesn't seem like they're even trying to have their own idea here. This is exactly how it happens in Chrono Trigger. You know, I don't really got a lot to speak on because it's been so long since I played Chrono Trigger. Uh, but, you know, the first game they made, the first successful game they made was not an RPG. You know, maybe, you know, uh, that plus like, you know, how bad I found the story. Maybe they just weren't meant to make something this grandiose maybe they weren't meant to have something with a complicated story or anything maybe, maybe they just are incapable of doing something like that i didn't get a chance unfortunately to uh, ever finish chrono trigger i did play it i enjoyed what i did but so i didn't have that connection or that uh that memory for that so I, unfortunately i didn't you know i guess not, unfortunately i didn't have to take to have that take on it but yeah i definitely agree though that it, they didn't seem like they were trying almost literally at all when it came to the story on purpose 
it's like it's like all right so you two both played chained echoes it's another one of these games that's like super influenced by old rpgs like can you imagine if like chained echoes like did the exact same thing that happens at the midpoint of final fantasy six and like everything was exactly the same like that that's what they're doing here just with a plot point from chrono trigger and it just strikes me as like really weird that they would copy it to this degree it's like exactly the same it's it's real weird there's a line between taking inspiration from a story and taking inspiration for uh, a, a game or a product that you want to make. And at some point you cross over that line into just copying their homework. And that's what this feels like to me. So it, it was supposed to be an emotional, like, you know, you're reuniting with Garl. And again, he's the only good character in my opinion, and he's back now. But in my head, I was like, wow, that was just blatantly just copying kind of sucked. A lot of cool story points shown through other characters and not the main ones. Yeah. You know, you talked about the golden pelican. Uh, oh, you have to do a, uh, the final boss for fishing is so that you can get a ticket for the golden pelican restaurant. The final boss for fishing, uh, fishing is, uh, awful. I wrote in my notes, you have to go into a sunken cave and do a fucking final boss for fishing comma. I hate this so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta see what it is. I'll definitely look it up. Uh, you, you go to have a meal at the golden pelican and this is, this is just felt like a, you know, a nice moment for the characters. Again, I, I don't care for the characters that much, but it was funny seeing them all dressed up. It's like, remember in final fantasy six, when like gal puts on a suit for that one scene, like (laughs) this is like that too. Like beast is wearing a top hat, uh, that, that mole that was causing problems. Uh, Malcolm mud has like this awesome robe that he's eating in. It's just, you know, funny to see him all dressed up. Garl has this sick yellow suit too. So like, aside from the achievement, like, do you get anything else from witnessing that scene or do you just get the scene? Uh, Garl learns the recipe for like this incredible food item. It like restores all your health, all your magic. Um, and like it might even revive everyone who's dead. It's like the best healing item in the game. And you only have the Fleshmancer to fight after that pretty much, right? Yes, but the Fleshmancer was tough. So I, I did Fair use enough. that item. Fair enough. So after that, you fight the Fleshmancer. Uh, it starts out the same. So like you're talking with him and he's kind of doing that thing where he's like, I'm too good to fight you. I'm not going to fight you. And he turns around and Garl kind of like steps out from behind the group and he just throws a fucking apple at the Fleshmancer's head. And that was really funny. That made Garl the fucking go. Garl yeah. the fucking go, bro. He's like, fight me, bitch. Like, what's up? I'm back. I'm very like surprised that. being that he hates Garl because it's basically him. Essentially, the character just <laughs> that you got all you have you have, like you have all these people that are super talented, and then you got this nigga who's just like has to work really really hard <laughs> to be able to fucking keep up. But he's still just put 150. You know what I'm saying? And he's still recognized. He's uh-huh. still the he's still dope. But he doesn't have much talent innately. You know what I'm saying? That's, doesn't sound like me. I'm perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, just very funny. Like one of the only like parts in the story where I was like, this, that was very cool. Like Garl was just like, what's up? You punk bitch. It throws an apple, hits him right in the head. Yeah. That shit was fucking funny. I did see the, again, I watched the video, uh, to see the true ending. And I did see that part, which I thought was awesome. Him to uh, just kind of swag out, call him out and finally get his revenge. That was tight. And, uh, yeah, then you, you fight the Fleshmancer. It's a really fun final boss because all the boss fights in this game are fun. Um, it was a really good challenge. And it also, like, you'll fight the Fleshmancer for a while, then it will go into that shoot em up section, and you'll do that for a bit. And then you'll go back to the turn based fight, and then you'll go back to the shoot em up section. Um, it, it was cool, like a, a, a good, really good final boss fight. Uh, but then at the end, you don't defeat him. Rashawn lets him leave again. Uh, so again, a, a bit unsatisfying there. I don't know if they're, they want to set up Sea of Stars 2 or some shit. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So uh, we already talked about the the ending with Brugaves uh, being the devil character. Uh, the difference here is Zale and Valir go off to do their patrol, except instead of like flying over the planet on Garl's birthday, now they come back many years later to visit and Garl's like old now. So like, and Valir and Zale haven't aged at all because they're gods now, basically. 
So that was pretty cool. Would have been a really cool original ending. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool to see them just uh, leap into that nigga's arms at the end. That was very cool. It was just like an old man just hugging his, like, his two grandbabies because they hadn't aged. But that's basically what it was. He was just might as well be the old man taking care of these little kids because as far as as far as personality, they were infants. That's that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they had their reunion at the end. You don't get any real resolution. I don't know, guys, like Sea of Stars 2, let's say they're the Fleshmancers causing shit again and Valir and Zale have to go take him on again. I'm going to have to like wait and see, you know, like. There, there's a bunch of other long RPGs that I would rather play right now than Sea of Stars 2. I'm going to have to like really wait, or if it's on Game Pass or some shit, if Game Pass exists in 2028, whenever Sea of Stars 2 will come sure. out. <laughs> they're they're going to have to show me a lot, man. That, that, it's a definite no from re- me right now. And like my thing is, is like, okay, so always they could like obviously make improvements and work on these things here and there, but with how much reception, like positive reception it's gotten, I don't think that they feel like they've done anything wrong. So I can't imagine that big of a shift from this game to another game to be enough for me to want to play it. But you know, who knows might be in a different place by then. I mean, I feel I enjoyed it enough to where if I thought the second was supposed to be like a, a game that took the first one further then I would definitely be willing to try to see what they were capable of doing. Uh, Cause I enjoyed it enough to, to be willing to be like, Oh, okay, let's see what they could have done with the second one. If they elaborate on some things. Cause I enjoyed the battle system. I assume they would hopefully get, get better. And maybe they get elaborate a little bit on that storytelling. Maybe they were, I mean, maybe they're strong finishers. Not good starters. I mean, maybe the story really picks up in the second one. They're able to finish strong with the Fleshmancer and explain what that weirdness was with the little boy. But I don't know. But I would be willing to, yeah. There is one thing after you beat the true ending. Um, there is another thing you can go do. It's just like an Easter egg for people who played the messenger. Um There are these items called flimsy hammers. If you get four of them, I believe, you can kind of break down these walls in the crypt near Mirth. Um, And you find this secret room where the shopkeeper from the messenger is in. And like, you guys didn't play the messenger, so that doesn't mean anything to you. But the the shopkeeper is a kind of a memorable character from that game. He's got great music, uh, tells a bunch of jokes and stuff. It's a fun character. And he kind of like pops out of this like cabinet that you find the cabinet is a source of a bunch of jokes in the messenger. Um, but he kind of pops out. He's like clearly not from your world, but he pops out and he's just like, yeah, you can go check out the cabinet. Like I'm out of here. Like you open Pandora's box, basically like, this is not my problem. I'm out peace. And he leaves. And then you go in the cabinet and, um, there's a room in like our modern times basically and they're having like a dinner party and you can talk to them uh the people in there and it's the people who work for sabotage um and i i this also i think is a reference to chrono trigger um i never saw it in chrono trigger but people tell me it is um, where in that game you could go into the secret room and you can talk to the developers as npcs so a little easter egg for the messenger people at the end Yeah, just to throw that out there for any Messenger fans still listening. uh, We're getting on two and a half hours. My voice is about to completely give out. Guys, thanks so much for coming on and uh, doing Sea of Stars with me. I love you, boys. It's always a pleasure. It was really weird doing an episode where I didn't have a lot of really nice things to say about something, but I I do feel it's a game worth being talked about. So I appreciate you having me on, brother. For sure. Both of you, obviously, open invitation to come back. We've already discussed the next thing uh, that we'll have you back on the show if everyone's up for it. So, uh, yeah, everyone listening, I appreciate you listening this far. Uh, I especially appreciate if you love Sea of Stars and you uh, listen to us kind of take a dump on the story here. But it's just unfortunately the feeling that I was left with after playing. Hopefully, as always, hopefully we explain ourselves well. Uh, But Thank you all for listening so much. Uh, again, appreciate everyone who does. And yeah, check down in the uh, show notes for the the other podcast, a top three podcast ratings and reviews. Check out the Patreon if you want to support that way. And tune in next week for the next game to come out of the backlog. 